All right, Blue Da Vinci, how's it going? Good, homie, man. I'm in the building. What's what's the word? Uh, man, you know, uh, you know, you got a, a extensive history, man. Um, you know, in L.A. and BMF and rapping, and you've been doing your thing for a long time, man. Um, just uh, glad to sit down with you. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate your time as well. For sure. For sure, man. Well, I figured we would just start from the beginning and let everybody kind of get to know you and where you grew up and everything about you and, and you know, kind of just take it from the top, man. So uh, can you tell everybody where you're from and, uh, you know, how, how were things growing up for you? Oh, man. It's your boy Blue Da Vinci, man. From California. Uh, from Los Angeles, California. Um, uh, I say probably around the age 16 or whatever like that, 16, 17, I got into the entertainment industry. I was traveling with Raz Kaz as my cousin. You know, a lot of people know about the rapper Raz Kaz, a hip hop rapper. Um, he's a cold lyricist though. But I was, you know, his roadie by like 16, 17, and jumped on the big screen in the movies, DJ Pooh, shout out to DJ Pooh, DJ Pooh. He put me in three strikes, you know what I'm saying? Which led to other movie opportunities for me as well, you know, early on, you feel me? But you know, I'm a rep, I'm from East Coast, one I know out in LA, you know what I'm saying? A gang repping out of Carson and Delamo, you know what I'm saying? So that's where I spent some of my young, my young years, you know, like nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you know what I'm saying? And then moved back out into LA, continued to move around until I hit it and just became a, uh, uh, United States Globe Trotter, you feel me? What the, what age did you jump off the porch? Shit, let me see. I probably jumped off the porch like thirteen. You know what I'm saying? Thirteen, fourteen. Really jumped off the porch. Had a mind of my own. You know what I'm saying? Figured out how to make start making me some money and shit. Make my own money and shit like that. So, you know, I grew up gang banging like a lot of inner city kids in, in California, in Los Angeles, California. Um, you know, doing all of the shit that we do gang banging and, and uh, you know, getting in trouble and the gang banging, the fighting and the bussing and the hanging out and the whole thing, you know what I'm saying? So growing up, but it was fun, you know, in California, we we always have fun. So like being out on the Shaw and you know, around, start rapping and meeting everybody out in the streets and just being out there, you know what I'm saying? As a young, I was always one of them that was outside, that was out there, you know what I'm saying? So. I grew up knowing a lot of people from all parts of uh, California, Northern and Southern California. Um, but yeah, outside of that, I just had a passion for the entertainment. I always wanted to be inside of entertainment ever since I was real little, you know what I'm saying? So that's where all that shit came from. But growing up was just regular gang banging in LA. What was it that made you want to get in the streets at such an early age? I mean, I was just there already. Everywhere I was, that's where I was. It was just like I, I wasn't nowhere else. I didn't want to be nowhere else. I didn't know nowhere else yet. All I knew was those streets. So I just was basically a product of the streets that surrounded me, period. You know what I'm saying? So from like my grandfather, <clears throat> my grandfather lived and I grew up partially on 54th and Van Ness. You know what I'm saying? And then when my mom graduating college and being a little older, by the time I came around, I got a sister that's 10 years older than me. But by the time my mom finished college and got a better job and stuff, we start moving around more. She ended up getting married. We moved to Carson. You feel me? So it kind of moved on up a little bit for me from moving out from where we was at to moving over to Carson. And I just got a chance to do a little growing up in Carson. You know, I got to like age 14, I believe, in Carson. You know what I'm saying? Before she ended up getting a divorce and we moved away back, you know, towards the other way. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it was just I mean, it was just normal. You know, I never thought about how I grew up no kind of way because it was normal, like from boys in the hood to minutes to society to me waking up every day and going to school and all the same shit. You know what I'm saying? So there wasn't no big deal for me. What was school like for you? You mentioned school. What was that like for you? Where'd you go to high school at? I went to different places, bro. Uh, in high school, man, I dropped out of high school in like 11th grade. So by the time I got to high school, my mom was already divorced. So we was moving around. I was living in Hawthorne. I was living in different places. So I, um, my high school, bro, for real, I did ninth and 10th and left. 
You feel me? So I went to all kind of different Westchester, Losing, or Hawthorne, North High and Torrance. Like I was getting opportunity transferred out fighting and doing all the shit. You know what I'm saying? So high school was cool. I just, I was one of them kids, bro, that felt grown already. You feel me? So like this was in high school. I was with, I'm beefing with the Linux 13s and Hawthorne in high school, but I'm copying quarter pieces of hard from their OG homies down there on 116th and Inglewood. You feel me what I'm saying? Inglewood Avenue and shit. So I was, I was, I was a fast kid. You know what I'm saying? I like to say I had kids early. You know, my oldest son is 28. I got 28 and 27 year old kids right now. You know what I'm saying? So. I started early. I felt grown early. I was making money for myself early. You feel me? I just had a fast mind, a quick thinking mind, and I wanted for myself early too. So like out of my friends and kids and shit like that, that I grew up with, it was a few of us that did shit. Like a couple people end up going to like the NFL or NBA or some sport. A couple people that I grew up with. And then, um, a few people got off into entertainment, but I'm one of the early people that I know of my childhood friends that got into entertainment, you know what I'm saying? So, like I said, before I even met Meech and them and all that, I was doing motion pictures and shit. Like, I, I was already on TV and shit before I met Meech. Is that what you did when you when you quit high school and you stopped going? Did you like kind of No, no, nah, nah, when I quit high school, rapping? I was selling crack, bro. Yeah, I, I was I was just a bad kid when I quit high school. I wasn't trying, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't have the aspirations quite yet when I was finished with high school. I, fin I finished with high school because I had felt like at the time I had better to do than be in high school. You know, I wasn't as smart as I, I, I privy myself to be now, then, you know what I'm saying? So me feeling like I was making the right decisions back when I was 15 and 16 years old are different decisions from now. So those were the decisions that, man, I don't need to be in school, man. I get about this, bitch. I'm losing money in the motherfucking dope spot. You know what I'm saying? Like, I figured out, let me tell you what really made me leave school. No bullshit, bro. Some people will be able to feel this. Bro, I was selling crack, bro. And but my mom didn't know I was selling crack. You feel me? So I was still, I'm like a mama's boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, they get my mama eyes. I don't really do no wrong type shit. You feel me? I was one of them. Like, I'll blow your ass down this afternoon and be at home, like, eating cabbage and shit at night. Like, all right, mom, I'm going to finish cleaning that up. I got it. I was one of them kids, you feel me? So it's like we got over there, and then I seen that the time that I would go home and go to sleep to get ready to go to school in the morning would be probably at that time was like two o'clock in the morning. And then I'm up at like six thirty seven in the morning to go to school. So I'm sleep from two to seven or six, six thirty or whatever. But that's the time all the money was coming through. See the clucks, they work all night. The cluck heads, the bases or the junkies or what people say today. We used to say cluck heads and shit back then. You feel me? So the clucks would beg and do whatever they doing all night to get the money in there around four between four and eight in the morning nine in the morning is when they all used to come with all the money from getting it all night you feel me they'll come with something at the beginning of the night so they can get going and then they'll go out all night all your clients will go out all night and be hustling so i figure like damn the time i'm going home and going to sleep i got four homeboys doing the shit with me and they ain't in school they older and these got bread like this little shit like, y'all niggas getting all the money when I go to sleep. All right, I ain't going to school no more. I'm finna start popping LSD tabs, stay up for three days straight, and never go to sleep for three days and hustle. So that's where I was at when I left high school. It wasn't about no music. I didn't know no DJ Pool at the time. I didn't, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't into all that. It wasn't until me getting deeper in the gang banging. I had got shot one time and while uh, I was in the hospital, I got a call from Raz Cats and he was like, bro, I got this record deal. If you come out of this shit this time, man, just come on the road with me, get away from that shit for a while. Something else out here for you, bro. Like you love this music shit so much, bro. I got the deal now. You can come out here, bro. You ain't got to pay. It's going to pay for you. The label pay, the per diem and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, all right. Then I start being in Germany with Dickie's on and a t-shirt with some Converse in Germany, you know what I'm saying? Looking around. So that's kind of how it started for me. I would be on stage with him. I learn all the raps and be up there backing him up. I'm a dope performer and a good rapper. So I was good backing up Raz for some years. 
And he just took me around the world. And that's what exposed me for real, for real to the music industry. Now you go, you go on the road with Razzcast and are you already rapping at this time or? I mean, I'm rapping at this time, um, but I'm not a professional rapper at this time. So, you know, I was a kid that was rapping. You know what I'm saying? At that time, he was the rapper. He was the star. It wasn't me. I was just the backup. Like, I'm on the stage with there. I'm going to knock your ass out. I got a strap. I'm still from the hood. Like, for real, for real. If you want, I don't know. I don't give a about that shit because I was still him. I didn't understand about the music business. I was just really alone for the ride. My man is getting me kind of like out the hood a little bit and I'm seeing different shit and I love it. It feels good, smell good. I'm getting money I wasn't getting before. I don't think I was having as much money as I was having when I was younger and selling dope and shit. But I, the, the label was giving me $75 a day back then per diem and we'll leave for like three months. And so they give you the check at one time. So, you know, to be 16, 17 and a, getting a free legal $75 a day for 90 days times 90, 75 times 90. I mean, that bitch like seven. I don't know what the add up is, but I'm, I got bands. You know what I'm saying? So whole oh, free bands. That was before future free bands. I, you feel me? So it was good for me because I'm eating for free. I'm having sex with pretty girls and shit. I'm like a rapper and I'm not even one. I don't got no deal or none, but I'm with them. So I'm getting treated like one. I chose that shit over staying in the hood like that. You feel me? I wanted to be, then I start seeing the world. You feel me? Seeing how everybody everywhere wasn't so aggressive and everybody wasn't like how we are at home on the West Coast in LA. Me growing up, it was like all the male especially African-American males. I'm a, I ain't going to say all of them, but I'm going to say like 80, 85, 89, 92% of African-American males from the ages 15 to maybe me growing up, maybe 15 to 40 at that time when you meet them and you don't know them already, this is how the meeting goes. Hey, homie, where you from? Studies, look at what you got on and shit. Try to figure it out right quick. Where you from, homie? You feel me? It's just aggressive. It's not like, hey, brother, what's going on? Good day, man. How you doing today, man? Hey, man. I, blah, 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 blah. It's not that. It's not like love. It wasn't love when I grew up, bro. It was all aggression and all ah, just, ah, beast mentality. Just dog eat dog. Just why you standing there? Why you right here? Why you over there? Who are you? Who is y'all? What's up? This, that, this, this. You feel me? And I was a customer of that. I was a product of that. So that was my mentality. So leaving from California and going to all these different states and even out the country, it broadened my horizon to damn motherfuckers ain't like this everywhere. Like, oh shit, I never thought about over here when I go whatever state, they ain't on that. They like, hey brother, how you doing, bro? When I walk in the store and there's four guys outside the store. Hey man, hey, you ain't from around here, huh? We don't wear them kind of shoes, bro. Well, you must be from Cali, huh? Yeah, man, now we gonna call you Cali. Hey, bro, I always love y'all. Take, hey, I got Cali's water. Like, damn, nigga just bought my water in the store and I just walked in, it was outside. This is crazy. So that kind of culture shock kind of opened me up to be more mindful of what I wanted to do moving forward with life, flat out. You decide you want to do, I take music or entertainment a little bit Yeah, more. I wanted to be a rapper. I wanted to do music, so. I went in and I was doing music. I started doing music. I got with S Dog. I got producer. I found people. I just start, you know what I'm saying, getting into it. And throughout with being with Raz and meeting so many people, I had new people in the industry. You know what I'm saying? By that time, people that was close to being in the industry and people that was all the way in the industry. So I just put myself in there somewhere and ended up in rap groups and all of that kind of stuff, even out my neighborhood. I ended up being in a rap group out of my neighborhood and working with a guy out of my neighborhood named Wino. Shout out to Wino. Um, yeah, he's from my neighborhood. And he was also, he was a Coolio that just passed away, the late great Coolio, uh, Gangsta's Paradise and County Line. Uh, Wino was the guy that produced County Line. Uh, or, or was it Fantastic Voyage or County Line? I think it was County Line. One of them, but he was cool, one of Coolio's producers and he was from my hood, like an OG from East Coast. He's from my hood. So to, you know, be able to work with a person like that as a kid, he was a celebrity for me and a hood celebrity for me as a kid. So I was working with Wino, trying to get somewhere. We ended up not getting a deal. But then that, that, I ended up another, with, with, a, with a, through another channel working with a DJ Pool, who, which it became my mentor. And he, that's the person that put me in my first movie in Three Strikes, a movie he wrote. Now, DJ Pooh, for people that's not familiar, that's Red from Friday. They got knocked the f 
out. They had his grandma chain. That's he's the one that created Friday. He created the characters for the original Friday. He created the screenplay. He wrote all that funny shit. Felicia and all those people we love. He created those people from him and a couple people he had around those great minds. And I, I had a, a I didn't have the pleasure to be around when they created Friday, but I was around when he created Three Strikes, the movie. So I was like a student under DJ Poo at that time when he created Three Strikes. I had ran around with Razzcast for maybe like three years. I was maybe like 19 years old. And I um was a student of DJ Pooh's. He used to be in the studio with the likes of like a Snoop Dogg for two days straight and while he's recording and Charlie Wilson and all of the Dog Pound and all of those great West Coast people, Mac 10 and Dr. Dre would come through there and different people would come and check on uh DJ Pooh or do business with DJ Pooh because he was a, a West Coast, he is a West Coast icon. You know what I'm saying? So I was like studying up under a West Coast icon at the time. You know what I'm saying? And then he ended up asking me one day, man, you want to get in this movie we writing? While I'm in the studio trying to do some music and write to some shit. He's like, you want to get in this movie? And I was I was still young. So, you know, I was like, man, hell no, nah, nigga, I ain't finna be in no movie before I put out a, a song, nigga, an album, because they going to think I ain't real. Like, they ain't finna treat me like I'm some actor. That's back in the day. See, when I was young, the people used to treat the actors that used to rap like they wasn't real street. Cause they was actors. They faking cause they actors. And then we looked at the rappers like they the real street. They the ones that's in the, come from the streets. They us and actors, they just on TV. So it wasn't really cool to be an actor for me when I was 14, 15. You want to be a rapper. And if you get it, if you a good enough rapper and they start putting you in movies, then you go in it that way. That's how rappers would be in movies back then. Like, you know what I'm saying? They, they would get put in the movie cause they're a big rapper. So I told DJ Pooh, I was like, Hey, like, nah, I don't want to be in no movie before I drop some shit. Like, let's get me together and get me out there. And then I go, he's like, well, what about, I mean, it's my movie. I'm doing the soundtrack. What about if I put you in the movie and put you on a soundtrack at the same time they get released together? You know, he's just a grown man telling the young man something that I couldn't argue with. Like, hmm, that shit make a lot of sense. I never thought about it like that. All right, run it. So he put me in my first movie and put me on my, I believe, my first I ain't going to say my first real record because I think my first real record was with Ira Dorsey from the Dayton family bootleg. But anyway, um, yeah, that's how I get to that point. Through the streets of L.A., through gangbanging with Razzcast to DJ Pool into the movies. Now I'm on Paramount Pictures back lot. The big boy shit. You feel me? Like, oh, action type shit. You feel me? Seven days and play blue in that. They making memes about that scene right now. And that was in 98 or something we filmed that shit. And now you're doing movies, you got your music going, and at some point you meet Big Meech and everybody, and how, all how right, does all so that yeah, happen? All right, so yeah, while I'm there with DJ Pooh, um, and I'm working with him, not actually physically there when the situation happened, but somewhere along the way, uh, DJ Pooh met Meech through another guy named Wayne Wayne that he was doing a record label with at the time called Stomping Ground Entertainment. So they actually, from my understanding, they went to DJ Pooh to try to get DJ Pooh to help them with the label. And DJ Pooh was writing a movie at the time. He didn't really have the time to help them. And he put me with them. And I was there as a liaison. And he was like, look, sign Blue. Blue know how to do all that shit. They ain't really know too much about the music industry. They ain't know nothing about the music industry, actually. But he like, look, sign Blue. He know how to do all that shit. He'll get y'all through all that shit. Give him a little check. He be the artist and he can run all that shit. So I came in there, started making logos and doing photo shoots for myself and running around with Bob. I used to run me around for the record label or whatever. And Meech didn't really, or T, they didn't take part in no operations for the record label. They just like pull up the bread type shit. You know what I'm saying? And then that shit ended up going defunct. So once that label went defunct, we didn't have no label. And then in like 2001, we established BMF Entertainment Incorporated. And that's when BMF Entertainment Incorporated became a thing with a logo and a, you know, and marketing behind like a company and not just something that people saying on the streets. At one point, I think Meech stayed out here in LA. Or? All right. So when I met him, when I was working with DJ Pooh at that time, Meech was living in Gardena, California. He was living in Cali. I thought he was from Cali when I first met him. I didn't even know he was from Detroit when I first met him. I thought he was a Cali. Until I got to know him and got to know he wasn't from Cali. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, but uh, he was staying in Gardena. I ended up getting, you know, 
without getting into every little specific, like I and we ended up getting real cool, real close. You feel me? Um, I became like a little brother to him, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? As much to to where he moved me into his house. I got my home, my own apartment with my girl, a kid, and everything, and I still went over there because I'm trying to chase this dream. I'm trying to make this happen. So I feel like I need to be locked in with my situation and I'm going to take care of what I got to do. Like I've always done from wherever I'm at, you know what I'm saying? But at that time to make it happen, I needed to be next to dog, you know what I'm saying? So come from like 2000, maybe 2001, I was with Meech until 2005 till he went to prison. Once I got to the house in Gardena with him, I stayed with him forever for every house until I was buying my own houses. Yeah, Damn. I lived okay. with him the whole time. I, a lot of people don't know that either. They're like, yeah, you was you was an artist signed to the label. Me and this lived in every house together from the time that I met him. Every mansion that he bought, I lived in it. Everyone from the time that I known him, every single one for those years from L.A. to Atlanta to Texas to wherever we was at. Miami, wherever we had, he had a mansion that I was living there until I would live in them houses until I was having my own house in the same area. You know what I'm saying? Type shit. At what point did you guys move to Atlanta? Uh, I was like 2001 or something like, yeah, like 2001. So the Atlanta thing was like this. This, this was the thing where I got to give Meech his credit. Okay. So Meech did understand something about music. Okay. What he did understand about music is algorithm and how the how the algorithm of music shift shifted from coast to coast. He knew that probably from doing what he did and being on so many different coasts, doing what he did and being in the clubs and being able to listen to what people like in different places. He knew that, hey man, look, the exhibit era is over. That's what he was telling me back right when Exhibit was coming out. Like when at the Exhibit was, went all the way up and then started doing his come down, I was exhibited out because that was like part of the people that I knew and shit. You know what I'm saying? So he would tell me like, nah, it's the shit. Like all that. I'm, I love the West Coast. This whole shit is the shit. But right now, where this shit is going at, trust me, I'll be somewhere. I got to take you to Atlanta where they going crazy at. This little John and all this other shit. And he took me out there and introduced me to that shit. And this is like before T.I. was signed to L.A. Um, right when he was still running around with his little white do-rag and shit. When I first came out there, Meech first took me to Atlanta. I thought everybody was bloods because the state's color is, is like red. So when we get in the club, I get up there with Meech. I'm looking at everybody. Everybody got on red Pendleton's and red shirts. I'm like, damn, bro, we going to die in this. Ain't ain't nothing but bloods in this bitch. And me start laughing like, ain't no damn bloods in here, man. We in Atlanta, Georgia. Boy, they don't give a about that shit. It's they color. Georgia Bulldogs, Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta Falcons. What color are they supposed to wear? Purple? They color is red, black, and white. You're going to see that shit everywhere. And then, you know, that kind of shit made me grow up. That shit, shit helped me grow up. Like, damn, he right. This is they color. They all, they don't mean that they blood just because they got on red. I'm so trained coming from California. If you got on red and you look like this, you was a blood. What you talking about, nigga? Why you got on all that fucking red then, nigga? If you ain't no blood looking tough, a tough with red on to any that's a crip from California, you was a blood. I don't give a fuck where you from, nigga. Like, you be from Nebraska. Like, you got on that corn husker looking like this, nigga. You in the Compton swap meet, your ass is a blood. You ain't from Nebraska no more right then. That's just how we. That's my mentality. So I get out there and then, you know, it's just like a culture shock. So he did know how the shit moved around. You know what I'm saying? So he wanted to get me from out of L.A. and introduce me to Atlanta on that level. I had been to Atlanta before, like with Razzcast and shit, performing and doing different shit, Freak Nick and different shit, but event type shit. But I had never lived there to actually understand the community and live amongst the people in the community and know how they operate. You know what I'm saying? Who influenced Meech to like be affiliated with Crips and All right, so, do that? so when, when Meech moved to California, from my understanding, because anybody could correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, when he moved to California, he was with Wayne Wayne, he was over there at West Boulevard, so he knew a bunch of Crips already. He was certain from Cali that was Crips that I know, like OG that was Crips, so he knew him. But at that time, he still was on his Mari Gators, his, 
you know what I'm saying? His uh, uh, slacks with the with the uh, what's the name of them belt? Kieselstein belt buckles and all of this real fly from Detroit. That's like with, with money from Detroit, the type they was wearing. He still was on his D-boy time when I met him for real. And I just feel like when I met him, as our relationship progressed, he was impressed with the character that I was in real life. Like my real life character was impressive on that on that fun gang banging level, not on the kill somebody. He wasn't trying to kill people and do none of that shit. Just on the swag of a LA gang member. He he liked that shit. You feel me? He liked how it is like as this like hood from LA. You ain't gotta be a gang banger. You're just like hood from LA got a certain swag about they self. You feel me? And I feel like he f with that. Not just me, along with other people he knew from the West Coast as well. And I feel like Another thing, like at the beginning, no, no, no cap. At the beginning, I was young, so I felt like, well, damn, this what these having the Benzes and the money and all this shit doing like that. Hold on, let me put on the slacks and try to, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? Look like that, like how they look. Man, them niggas, we going to Billboard Live and shit in LA, the club I always be at every Sunday. I be at this club as the gang member. And then one Sunday, I done been with these niggas two, three months. One Sunday, I pull up to this. With some slacks on and some Gucci loafers and shit. And the gang is still out there. They like, hey, cuz, what you, you just came from church? Like, what is you, a Paul Bear? Like, Deacon Blue, like, on me laughing and shit, hood laughing. I'm like, oh, hell yeah, nigga. This, I knew this wasn't it. I felt nasty coming out in this shit. Like, they look good. They look like players, but that's for y'all. That's y'all thing. Like, my shit is khaki chucks, t shirt, regular little shit, Cortez. Like, at that time, that was like my, my get up. You feel me? So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I told him, like, yeah, bro. I, I told Meech, I was like, bro, I can't be wearing that shit. Like, it's on me, bro. When I go outside, I, I, I'm somebody out here. Everybody be knowing me. I don't wear that shit until I'm going to church or a funeral or something, bro. Like, I can't dress like that. Like, now I can because I'm grown. I was a kid then. You feel me? So I felt like that wasn't it. And so did everybody else in my community. <laughs> that was my peers. They felt like that wasn't it. But then that turned into them being in that shit. And I just was looking like the regular little gangbanger with them for some months. And then from that point, bro, it just... The Mew Mews and shit start going out the window, getting put in boxes and shit, and more t-shirts was getting bought. It was on some gangster shit. Nigga grew their hair out. Widows peak and the waves was gone and braids came and my cousin from Compton was there and it just turned into a little gang bang and kick it. You know what I'm saying? With Big Meech and he was with it. He was with it so hard that for a little while you couldn't even smoke weed with, and light it with a red lighter in the house and you couldn't drink out of a red cup, the plastic red cups. He's like, nah, nigga, nah, cuz, you can't drink that shit out of no red cup in my house, cuz. We used to be like, nigga, where you from? Like, nigga, I ain't from nowhere. No matter, just crip, cuz. Like, that type shit. You feel me? Just influenced by the culture. Not actually trying to be from a gang and go rob people and go up the community. We up the community enough. You understand what I'm saying? So his thing was more of the impression, like somebody from out of state fucking with Easy E. They fucked with Easy E back then. You know how many was going to grab khakis and having curls and talking that gangster shit when Easy E and Ice Cube and them was going back and forth? A bunch of that ain't from Cali was doing it. It was that same type shit. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I just think that he kind of just really embraced that L.A. gang culture, once me and him got real cool, Baby Blue came around, rest in peace, God bless his soul. Baby Blue came around, he was still banging to the fullest damn near in college and shit. When I had him around, I got from Compton, other niggas coming from Carson, L.A., from Inglewood, the producer from Nine Deuce, Inglewood family. So when you look at Meech's crew, like if you was to go and look at a DVD and type in your computer, uh, BMF in the club, Right, it's gonna show Big Meech and me and a bunch of and a lot of them was right from LA. That was my homeboys that I implanted in that situation that I was allowed to have be able to come into that situation. And it wasn't nothing that happened overnight either. It took a long time to have them people that was with me in there, like over a year. You know what I'm saying? Because you know whatever he had going on, he had that shit Trump tight. So I was an artist, so he was with me on some music shit, but he wasn't with me on this, no other shit. 
So he didn't want me bringing all my friends and having everybody know where I'm staying at and going to and what he got going on. So I wasn't telling nobody. Like I even got jumped in my neighborhood and shit. I feel like people felt a certain kind of way because didn't nobody know what was going on. Ain't nobody know. I'm pulling up in the bins, going by an ounce of crowning. A month ago, I was pulling up in the Beretta buying a $10 bag, piecing up with another nigga on it at that point in time. You feel me? So like, what the f Pulling up every car, got three one on the place, nigga buy Four, five hundred dollar ounces of weed and shit. What the fuck this nigga got going on? But I can't say nothing to nobody. I'm like, I ain't saying nothing, nigga, till I make it to the top. Once I make it, then everybody can know what was going on. It was like that. And then he start, once we got cooler, he start allowing me to, but he allowed me to bring bull. And it was just me and Bull for a minute. Then Bull brother over there. So me feel like, damn, I remember when my little brother wanted to go and was telling him he can't go. Man, let your brother come. So now we got big cuz. His little brother to him, it's big cuz to the homies. So now I got Bull and big cuz with me. Now that's a, that's a, I was a cold triangle right there. We squabbing with everybody, nigga. We a squab with your whole crew. Us three in the triangle. So I had to heart with me already. And all I had to do was just build from there. More than it, Big Bull now, and then Baby Blue from college. And then we just, I just put that crew together. Met Eli out at 112 in the club. And he used to always tap in and with me every time he used to see me. And next thing you know, boom, got him up in that motherfucker after about six, seven, eight months. I him like, bro, you got to have me with the fam. I tell that nigga Meech, man. Meech, one niggas couldn't even talk to Meech back then, bro. Only reason why niggas could talk to me is because I was talking to people because I was doing music. I was trying to see who rapping, and that was my job. I got to scan through the people and see who's what to see who we going to be signing, see what we doing. I'm running the label at this time. You feel me? When we started BMF, BMF, I incorporated solely. You feel me? After the stomping ground went bad. You get there, you're, you're running the label. You're, you're doing everything, man. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You and Meech are tight at this time. You know, what would like, you know, we've heard some crazy stories about money and going out, man. You know, what, what do you think was like the wildest time, you know, hanging out at that time? I mean, the, the era was just the wildest time because all of the nights to me is a blur and they the same. We did the same thing all the time. People only talked about it when they saw it. You know what I'm saying? So it's just different people talking about the same thing they saw on different occasions at different times. So to me, it was all the same. There wasn't no favorite best to me, because I could, I will sit here all night and I could just keep having memories of, uh, we used to be in the club when we ain't working. We used to be in the club month, two months straight, every night doing the same thing, 40, 50,000, 60,000 every night. So it's like all the nights is the same. What do you think was like the most you guys threw away in the club in one night? I don't know. It just depends on how many people was there because that's what it depends on. If you got, 10 people with $10,000 and y'all all together as a crew to go spend money at the club. How much did your crew spend that night at the club? Yeah. A hundred thousand. I've seen a... So that's what was happening. Like, a lot of times people were like, yeah, Big Meech wouldn't spend $300,000 at the club. Nah, Big Meech might have spent a 60. He wasn't crazy. Like, that didn't know how to spend money. He wasn't stupid. He will spend a knot. But then he, it's 30 other n****s in the club that got bread. So collectively... At the end, next morning, when they go to looking at their pocket, shit, I brought 20 out. Nigga, I brought 10 out. I brought 18 out. I had six on me. I had, shit, boy, we spent like 320000 in that bitch last night. As a crew, as BMF, it was nothing, no, never nothing about one man with BMF. They trying to make it to one man, Big Meech, alone at this point in time. But nah, back then, that shit was always a community event. And that's what he created. He created everybody to be together, to have some money. So everybody putting up. Now you couldn't tell, like he said back then, you couldn't tell the that took out the trash from the that had all the bricks. Everybody got chains and big ass whips. That was in one of my raps. I seen there was a time where you guys couldn't get into a club. So you guys got a helicopter and dropped it, off some it money? It wasn't a club. That was a birthday bash. It was a concert. The summer concert, like summer jam. It was the birthday bash in Atlanta. So we went with like 80 of us or something. We had too many people latched on to come to that shit with us. And I was supposed to perform. I was set to perform that year. I believe it was like 04, 03. Um, and they didn't let us in. And Misha just was like, well, if we all can't get in. Ain't none of us going in. So then Mama Jews, rest in peace, God bless her soul. She was like the main marketing lady for BMF uh, Entertainment at the time. And she the one that had to plug with the helicopter shit and whatever. She was like, let's just take one of the helicopters up and throw the ones from, and the flyers from Blues, uh, from the Juice Magazine pamphlet and Blues mixtape 
or the single with a uh, E40. That's what it was. It was the flyers with me and E40, and then one a bunch of ones. We went and got a bunch of ones and filled up a big ass black trash bag, and that shit was flying over the top of the the venue, and we dumped that shit out the helicopter, and all that shit like rained over top of the whole crowd of the venue. And they, and then my DJ was there on the mic. So like for my set, when I was supposed to perform, she told him like, oh, they wouldn't let BMF in. They was too deep, y'all. But you know, they was finna kill away. Matter of fact, is that Big Meech and Blue Da Vinci right now coming across the sky in a helicopter? And she did that from the stage as my DJ on stage. And then we came across and dumped the shit out the helicopter and that shit fell onto the crowd and shit. You know what I'm saying? So that's what that whole thing is. People get, you know how it is when they tell a story for so many years, they get twisted to I was a club and I don't know. That shit had like 15,000 people there when we did that. Oh, okay. Okay. At one point, uh, does Jeezy and everybody kind of come into the picture? Okay. So, yeah. So I was rapping, like I said, coming from California, coming when he went, Meach brought me to Atlanta. First record I did in Atlanta was with Too Short. He was living in Atlanta at the time. But then we didn't move there yet. So that next year, I think that was like 99, 2000, we start going there. 2001, by the time we moved to Atlanta and then that stomping ground label was over because the Too Short record was under the stomping ground label. Once that label was over and we started BMF and then we had moved to Atlanta, then that's when I was putting records out in Atlanta and this, this community wasn't really with it because you got to remember like, watch this. This is like 2000. Lil John is still popping. If it's your fault in the club, so I don't give a That's what was going on. Get crunk, nigga, or get crunk. And then Atlanta, that's all you heard. Crunk, nigga, a town storm. All that hoo haw shit was going on when we came down there, right? It wasn't no, hey, gangster local motherfucker. I'm a West Coast rapper. You feel me? So I come down there in my khakis talking about what up, Loke was cracking, homie, and blah, blah, blah. They like, nigga, what? They, don't, they like, nigga, this shit corny as fuck. This talking about these balling, but what is this nigga talking about looking like Easy e So I had to sit back because I was the president of the company, but I was just the, I was the only artist at the time. So being now, I got to switch modes. Like, all right, we down here. I got to switch it up. I got to get one of these from out here that speak the lingo. I got to dress him up like a L.A. gang member because Dr. Dre say the costumes sell records. Y'all ask Dr. Dre, did he say that? That means the Dickies, the Converse, the, that's the costume. All right. It sells records with whether you know or movies or whatever. That West Coast custom sells. OK, I need somebody to put the clothes on to talk this BMF shit that they see us doing with the country, with that country voice. And that country twang, that country swang on it, how they talk. Hey, dog, what the fuck? Shout what the what going on? It sound totally goddamn different, dog. When the nigga motherfucker forgot now, and let him talk to you, show for real. So I don't give a fuck, nigga. What the fuck these niggas talking about? What? You know what I'm saying? From LA gonna be like, hey, cuz nigga, what the fuck these niggas on, nigga. Nigga, smash that shit, nigga. Real, nigga on the home. Dead homies. What's happening? It's two different things. So when I went rapping this, they couldn't get with that. It wasn't at a time so fast paced now that you put it out and get it overnight and it's cool. It wasn't that yet. They still had their tradition, their thing that they was doing. So I had to recognize that and say to myself, all right, I got to go grab some from down here. So the first person I grabbed was attempted to grab was Baby D. Uh, shout out to Baby D and Oont Camp. Um, so yeah, I was fucking with Baby D. That nigga ended up, ended up seeing Jeezy in a Magic City parking lot one night. Didn't know who he was, but I was listening to one of his songs on one of these Southern Bread mixtapes at the time. So uh, everybody that know about back in the day, Southern Bread mixtapes, shout out to uh, Southern Bread. Uh, but uh, Baby D was in my car. We had Magic City in a parking lot waiting for the girls to come out. They doing a tip out. So we waiting at the end of the strip club after everybody leave out the parking lot for the girls to come out so we could take them home and have another strip party at the crib in the indoor jacuzzi and that's why I was living back then nigga I had at that house when I met Jeezy nigga, I had the Olympic size swimming pool the tennis courts with the indoor jacuzzi and the paintball arena in the backyard at my house in Doraville you know what I'm saying so Jeezy was in the parking lot in a broke down Chevy that night. His Chevy was broke down. It wouldn't turn over. And Baby D knew who he was by face. I knew who he was by the song I would listen to. Um, and he was like, hey, man, that go that boy whose song uh, we be listening to right there, Lil' J, uh, Jeezy. And I'm like, oh, shit, he, he, he 
fucked up, man. Let's go over here and check him out. You know the nigga. So we go over there, holla at him and shit. You straight, bro? Man, this motherfucker won't turn over. Like, you need a tow truck or something, my nigga? And, you know, Baby D introduce us and shit. He like, yeah, I called a tow truck for him. So while the tow truck coming, the girls come get in the cars. We in the twin Hummers, H2s, year of. Niggas know that's like 02, 03 or something, whenever year they came out. Um, so boom, on deuces, might I add. Um, so the girls get in the car, the tow truck come, put his shit on the bed. He like, what y'all finna do? I'm like, bro, we finna go to the house, fuck with these hoes, nigga. I'm finna jump in the studio. I got the lab in the crib. I'm like, you want to roll? You can roll. He like, hell yeah, boom. He jumped in. It was all good. Boom. He rolled to the crib. We did our first song together, Rich and Rock Ice. I don't know if people heard it, but if anybody ever heard it. it even though it's rich and a rock ice, I still bust a nigga head on a block, all right? Even though it's ball and I keep dough, I still turn it head to a peephole. So we had like split the hook, and that was like the first record we did at my crib out there back then. And that's how I met Jeezy. Now, from that point, I figured that I wanted him to be one of the artists on the company. So I started working with Jeezy. You know what I'm saying? So I would have him, you know, start coming out to the events and shit like that, getting him involved with the studio, showing him what's up with recording in the big studio. Back then, he ain't know, like, he used to ask me questions like, hey, dog, well, why you be spending all that money going to patchwork, nigga? You spending all that money and shit, and you got that nice ass studio in the crib. And the studio in the crib was nice, but it was a pre-production studio. So, and I would let him know back then, like, bro, like these is playing professional ball. Like when we make records and we dropping records, we got to go up against, to me, and Fabulous and Frankie Beverly and Mays and Michael Jackson and whoever record has been professionally mixed and mastered that is up professionally. So if we're going to be professionals, we got to pay ball like professionals, bro. And then he kind of was getting it like, oh, shit, all right. And then all the shit was coming out. Just, you know, how people in music know that. You go from pre-pro and you start blowing your shit out, mastering your shit, it just get that much bigger and it just made it sound that much bigger and made him more, that much more comfortable with the music. I just told a nigga put them dickies on and shit, look like an L.A. Crip. Talk this BMF shit you seeing and, and, and talk with that country. Hey, nigga, yo, with that country swine. And we up through there. That's what the country need right now. And that's what we created in Jeezy. Now, Jeezy starts to get a buzz and everything going. All right. So, and yeah. Um, if you go back, if you date back to the Raw Report 2003, I believe. It, it shows, I do, a, I do a label launch. That's the official label launch for BMF Entertainment, the record label. Big Meech and Blue Da Vinci's record label, BMF Entertainment. The label launch was in Atlanta in 2003 at the Pepsi Cola Pavilion. The DVD of the Raw Report, it shows this whole week of this label launch. That's what that Raw Report DVD is. It's a DVD of the label launch. And in this label launch, I introduced Jeezy as a new artist to Atlanta. He lived in Atlanta. You understand what I'm saying? So at that point in time, he didn't have the buzz or the steam. Or when I first met him back then, he wasn't looking like that. He wasn't wearing that gangster that he was wearing when he dropped. He wasn't talking that he was talking when he dropped. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't until he got exposed to this BMF lifestyle as when it's what enabled him to have the content that he released with for the country to fall in love with. You know what I'm saying? And if people... You could go back and look in history and look at the music that he had before he met Blue Da Vinci and look at even the videos and the music that he had before Blue and then what he had after Blue. You could see the transition. Nigga. You could see it from one video to the next. Like, oh shit, he was doing this. Then he popped up with motherfucking 501s with big Air Force Wars with the rag tied on his head, sagging, looking like a crip from L.A. You feel me? So it was like, damn, he switched it up. Then he slowed down the flow. Start. Last time I checked, I was a man on these streets. They call me Residue Ali, blown these beats. Uh, hit the brakes, hit the lights, and voila, that go them bricks. That's a combination from out of spot car we had. He ain't never said no shit like that before. Like, this is all of the jewels and the shit that he getting. He's soaking up the environment, and he was my man at the time. That's what I had him there for. That's what you do. Put this shit in your raps, look like this, and sound like how you sound. And we gonna get up through there. You feel me? He just didn't sign the record deals with us. And we was left out of them. Okay, and at one point, Big Meech gets arrested. Oh, yeah. So Wolf, Wolf, murder. Wolf got uh, killed. Wolf and Lamont, they got killed at a, a club out, out in Buckhead, Atlanta. 
and they charged Meach with this is a double homicide. They charged Meach with Meach went on house arrest. So at this point in time, prior to the to the shooting, it was a certain way that dealt with Jeezy or anybody that I was dealing with from that music standpoint. The street, the gangsters that ain't doing no music that's with us, BMF, they wasn't too privy to all the I was doing music with. It was like, oh, them rap ass, we the street. We the, it was one of them kind of things going on. And um, it wasn't until that shooting happened and then Meech had called me. He had sent everybody to L.A., called a shot. He sent everybody to L.A. that, or everybody, not to L.A., but everybody to wherever they was from at the time, because it was a bunch of people from different places around. So wherever he was from, he had to leave Atlanta and go there till he figured out what was going on with his situation. During that time, he called me in L.A. and was like, bro, I need you to send somebody, nigga, bring me these bitches from the club. I'm on house arrest. I can't go out, but I'm out the house. They got to bring me some weed, some drink. I got to be, you know what I'm saying? So only person I had to send over there was Jeezy. So that's when Jeezy and Meech get cool like that. They knew each other from Jeezy being around already, but that's when they get tight, like how me and Meech is. You know what I'm saying? So um, this is the same time when Jeezy signed all the record deals. Now, how I, I believe that if Meech knew the industry or if he knew about music and contracts and shit like that, Jeezy wouldn't have been able to sign all them record deals without us and, le and exclude us because we had already been spending money and doing different shit, you know what I'm saying, with him and for him at the time. As a matter of fact, when, um, when, that, when, that, when that double homicide happened, it was the third day of a 45-day studio session that I paid for in the A room at Patchwork. Jazzy Faye was in the B room next door making beats for Birdman. Um, 45 days at 1500 a day or 1200 a day or something. For 45 days, paid up front, brown paper bag. Uh, I had scheduled out the first week of recording, and I had the first, I believe I had the first week, and then I broke down between the next three weeks. Everybody else that was involved with the label was a few different acts at that time. Uh, Jeezy was one of them. Um, do you think Jeezy signed those deals because of what happened with Meech? I think he signed those deals in, yeah, being scared of what was going to happen because he was involved with us. So he don't know if it was going to be over for Meech. It was him, Kinky B, and Coach K. They ain't know if it was going to be over for Meech. Oh, man, this shit going to be over for them BMF niggas. Boy, we better sign all this shit right now. We can't have none of them niggas. Do not call Blue. Here, but stay in this studio session. Let's make as much music as we can for Def Jam. On this studio session that Blue left you in because he the homie and he looking out for you and been promoting you and telling everybody you BMF and told you to dress like an L.A. Talk all this shit and put you in the SL 500, the black one, and you know what I'm saying? Did all this different shit for you, but let's go ahead and leave the nigga out of it. Meech don't know no better, so I kick it with him every day and ain't no problem. He know I'm signing the deals and he like, oh, hell yeah, it's on, man. It's going down. It's popping. We made it. And he's going to tell the nigga, yeah, nigga, it's going down. But his name ain't on no paperwork. So that lets you know where the business sense was at. Ask Dame Dash these questions. Somebody put Dame Dash and ask him, like, what should have happened? All right, let me explain to y'all what was supposed to happen. Number one, I was young, and it was my fault. So don't, y'all, I say Jeezy did it. It was some sucker shit. But it wasn't his fault. It was my fault. A sucker going to do what a sucker going to do. It's your job to prevent sucker shit. And I was a kid still learning. I didn't know all these rules and shit yet. I was still growing into the person that I am now today. So the same thing that happened then can't happen today, but it happened then. You feel me? So I'm working under the pretense of Meech buying a $100,000 worth of jewelry, riding around my black SL, riding around Meech baby mama Porsche truck, Meech Ferrari. We put in playing DJ $3,000 in the club to pay the music. We promoting the shit hard. I'm not feeling like a gonna run off with the bag if the opportunity came. It wasn't time to get the bag. He took a chunk change amount. He took what we were throwing in the club as his deal. Like, we ain't supposed to take that. We supposed to turn these records up, like how they turned up anyway, and then we supposed to wait eight, nine months and spin back around up to New York when this whole nation is yelling this shit after that run that he got paid $750,000 to go on. That was like a three, four million dollar run to me up front money. And that would have gave BMF the label imprint. OK, so this was supposed to happen. CTE should have been signed to BMF as a label. Jeezy would have been signed to itself to CTE. OK, BMF would have been signed to Def Jam as a label imprint, which would have put Big Meats, Demetrius Flinnery and Barima Blue Da Vinci McKnight in the office at Def Jam in New York. There would have been no more bricks. 
he would have got upfront money. And it would have been more than 750 because it would have been Blue doing a deal, not Jeezy them. You know what I'm saying? Because I would have made sure that we was worth more than what they thought, what they gave him money, because he was worth more than what he took. But I would have made sure that everybody knew it, the right things would have been happening. I knew the right people at, the, at that time and shit like that. It was the perfect opportunity for us when it was that time, when the numbers matched up to, you know, the hype of what was going on. And that's the point that we was at. And so he ended up signing them record deals, bro, leaving out, left me out, left me out. Um, and we were just still on the streets, thugging it, doing what we do on the street, gang. That's how that shit turned out. How did you guys meet Gucci, man? And how did Gucci's all that- Gucci's a street. He just be outside all the time. You feel me? Gucci like was like a, a jack boy, part-time jack boy, part-time dope dealer, part-time rapper. G Gucci was a slash man. I knew Gucci before I knew Jeezy. You know what I'm saying? So Gucci used to always be in the club. And Gucci already be in the club on the wall looking at him with a drink and with his hat down and like that, trying to get him a victim. You feel me? And, you know, he was cool. Meech knew him. He was cool. And he even used to try to get down with the mob, but Meech was telling him, like, nah, man, be out here robbing. You feel me? We can't have no, there's no robbers getting down. It wasn't like he was just no robber, but know that he going to get down on it. You feel me? Type. So we just kind of wasn't doing that at the time. So we he always been a friendly, you know what I'm saying? Always been the homie. So when they made so icy, we was promoting Jeezy. So what we tried to do is we tried to buy the record. I was going to buy the record for me. So it was going to be me, Jeezy and Gucci. Once they made the record, I was going to just buy it from Gucci with his verse on it and put Jeezy on it. It's going to be me, Jeezy and Gucci. But then Gucci asked Meech for a hundred thousand. So Meech laughed and like, you crazy. I ain't get no Hundred thousand, no stupid song. He crazy. Meach, well, you know, he ain't understand the, the the importance and the significance of having to pay that type of money for a record that could potentially be a hit record. That record went on and did numbers. It was worth a hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying back then. But Meach didn't know. I didn't have no control over the hundred thousand. I didn't get no anyway because I feel like we were gonna do it with or without that song. It just was about us working with Jeezy. I put myself in president role so we could put this out. You feel me? So I, we were straight. You know, I said, the Icy song just helped. They just end up doing it together. And just Jeezy and Gucci just end up doing it together. You know what I'm saying? So um, that was that. And after that, or not too long after that, you know, they have a big fallout over this song that I guess they both want to use it. Uh, you know, do you know exactly how, you know, or, or what happened with their fallout or anything? I mean, the whole... It, the, all right, look, the record, the record, it was Gucci Man record. All right. Jeezy was on the record. He put Jeezy on the record. We had Jeezy heating up. Gucci was with us. I, it's a version with me on the record. It was all three of us at the beginning. I got the version with me on Icy at the beginning. All right. Uh, that's when I say uh, uh, 200 on a dash. And, and we done made the name blowing money fast. Everywhere we go, we drop big loot. Every car we ride, we dip big coops. We the reason stepping the game up. Neck two million, still stepping my chain up. That was the verse, part of the verse on my Icy verse on the Icy record. Because we was going to buy it from Gucci. It was going to be my song. We gonna, I was going to drop with that record. Damn. Right? But he wanted 100000 Me Each one buying it. So now I just stay with them two on it. Me like, man that record. That's where it really came from. Me saying that we ain't giving that no hundred thousand dollars for that song. It came to like some like that. It wasn't even Jeezy. It was really Meech that, that denied it, not Jeezy. You feel me? And then I, I, I guess I'm just guessing at this point, being in the situation and thinking about it, I guess just Gucci probably felt a certain kind of way because I came back with his countered his offer of a hundred thousand. Like, get the out of here, boy. We'll keep seeing you in the club. We ain't paying no hundred thousand, no stupid song. That was Meech's take on it at the time, at that time, even though he's the one that wanted to buy the song. If Gucci would have said, man, give me 15,000, even if you said 20, he probably would like 20,000 for this, man, get his a 20 stack, man. I don't know why I just paid 20,000 for a dumb song, but whatever. He might have did that for 20, but that hundred made him say, you got a hundred, you know how many bricks? Watch out. I ain't even with this talking about that's how Meech played it and I just feel like Gucci felt a certain way now at that time Gucci was making his own noise and Jeezy noise was being made through the voice of BMF so Gucci felt like 
I'm doing this on my own by myself. You got all them with you to make you popping. So that's how the and then Jeezy felt like I got the better songs. All the city really with my music more than yours. So they just had this two personal going on for a while, bro. And that just went all the way into that other because, like, mind you, you got to remember something. What I tell you, like, I did an interview the other day and it was like, oh yeah, they were saying it was my fault that Jeezy and Gucci. Or that Pookie came to that house and Gucci killed them in the house. It was me. My fault. I wasn't with Jeezy already on the Raw Report in 2003. After he had signed them record deals, bro, I already won. Because I knew what happened. I knew he had left us out. I knew he had cut us out. I knew he had us. Just these streets don't know because they don't know no industry, bro. They street just, I'm a gangster, crip, and I'm a... Industry. Remember, I'm telling you, I've been moving around to getting a per diem check since I was 15, 16 with Razzcast. So I've been inside the labels, talking to the vice president, the head of A&R, all the way to the marketing, to the promotion department. I know how the whole label run at 16 years old. So I knew all this shit already. I know Brian uh, uh, Turner, uh, uh, Andrew Shack, and all these people that ran priority in the 90s. I brought the Slim Shady Eminem tape. Get this on my mama. Anybody ask the Jewish man, Andrew Shack, I brought Eminem tape to that first before Dr. Dre signed him. Me and Razzcast finna go to uh, New York and I just came from Maritime Hall in the Bay and I just watched Eminem perform for the first time. Blew my mind. I took that tape back and took it straight to the head of um, the head of uh, 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 A&R, Andrew Shack. Which was the vice, yeah, he was the head of NRD and then he became the vice president. He was the head, he was the that signed niggas. He was just doing a rhyme and reason soundtrack. He was in the middle of doing a rhyme and reason soundtrack, nigga, and I brought him Eminem. Y'all look up the dates, nigga. See if the album Rhyme and Reason came out the same year that Eminem got signed, nigga, because it was like, we was going in New York, nigga, for three months, 90 days, and by the time we got back, that nigga Andrew Shack called me into his office like, you like, Dr. Dre just signed that kid, that tape, that is, the tape is still in my deck. You left in here before y'all went on the road. Dr. Dre signed him. Why you didn't tell me? I said, I did tell you. He's the hardest white boy I've ever seen rapping in my life. That's why I brought it in here. I didn't have to bring this shit in here. Brought it in here to you for a reason. I was just 16. They weren't respecting my gangsta. I was a kid. Why this Razzcast little cousin bringing a demo tape in here? Get the fuck out of here, man. I'm doing big business. I'm getting ready to be the vice president of Priority Records in L.A., Hollywood. Fuck out of here, little 16-year-old. That's how he looked at me. Somebody get Andrew Shack on the motherfucking phone, call him, get his IG or something. He's still around here, tell you, yeah, blue. He wasn't blue Da Vinci then, he was just blue. Brad's his little cousin. And right, he brought me Slim Shady. But see, these didn't know the music industry like that. They knew bricks, and that's it. So when it came down to Jeezy being next to Meech every day while all the rest of these BMF out of town until this situation get cleared up with this double homicide. It just meets and Jeezy every day. So Jeezy, you know, he's sliding that shit in. Hey, dog, they talking about signing this nigga, boy. Next week it might be on, boy. Trying to tell him to do this shit for the fam, dog. Doing this shit for the fam, dog. Everybody finna be, no, nigga, legal Lambos. Nigga, they ain't have to worry about this shit no more, dog. Doing this shit for the... So he went and signed all the record deals and then I got a call after like, nigga, I did it for the fam, nigga. I just signed with Puff, nigga, and Def Jam, nigga, and Jazzy Faye and Block. Nigga, I said, you did what? You signed what with who and what and how many, nigga? It sound like Jeezy you ain't never gonna you, get right? no money. Huh? Jeezy calls you? Yeah, he called me after he signed me this. He had to. He was working under me before I left. I left him in my 45-day studio session. Nigga, that cost 1200 a day. You don't think he called me? He had to call me. He should have called me before he signed the deals, but he waited because the snakes and they waited because I believe that the people pressured them and told them niggas they couldn't sign with us and they couldn't do nothing with us. I believe that's what happened. I don't know it to be a fact, so I don't really talk about that, but I believe something happened. Either that or they just was some scary ass. Oh, man, BMF going down, man, with that wolf shit, man. Big meat. They just, ain't no African-American ever made it out of a double homicide. Man, I can see them now. And then they went on and took their opportunities, bro, and left us out. And he was still with Meech every day. And he even told Meech he was signing the record deals. But Meech didn't know nothing about, he didn't know, bro. If you was to ever ask Meech about music or entertain, or hey, man, what's the next artist, or where y'all recorded this at, or how much do we call, what machine was, or what video, he gonna be like, hey, look, man, I don't know nothing about that shit. Y'all got to go holla at Blue about that shit, bro. And nigga, you talking about a brick, holla at me, nigga. That, that everybody that know me know that. That's easy. 
It was me that was doing all the entertainment shit, bro. I made, I created the logos. That BMF logo, the big M that say BMF Entertainment Incorporated, the first shirts that we wore, 30, 40, 50, 60 of us at a time. When BMF was the deepest, that's my logo. I went and created that shit. Yeah, I went and told him I wanted to look like IBM. And that's what he created, the BMF. I looked like that in them lines with the big M in the middle. Because I told him I wanted to look like IBM. I wanted to look like a big company, big corporation. I don't want to look like Master P and them shit with a bunch of bullet, bullet shots and money and, and rims and shit all on the cover. That's when all that was cool. That's when it looked like that. You know what I'm saying? That was in that era. Remember cash money shit, all borough juvenile and the 400 degree, how all them covers look? That's what everybody was into. And I just said, you know what? Nigga, I want this BMF shit just to be black and white. That looked like IBM. Nigga, a big ass corporation, whatever could come from under this umbrella. Nigga, it don't make no telling what company gonna come from under this bitch. That's what I wouldn't create a BMF as. Misha wasn't there, his name wasn't on. He, he the one that told me to go do it though. He told me to go incorporate it without his name so we wouldn't get in no trouble if the shit hit the fan. It was, it was supposed to be like that. I ain't saying I just did it because I was smarter than him, no. He the one that had me go incorporate the company once we figured out that we was gonna actually use the name BMF. Okay, I, I wanted to touch back. You were gonna clear up the rumor about you starting the Jeezy and Gucci Gucci beef. Yeah, hell no. Nah. No way. I couldn't start the beef unless they are referring to when we tried to buy the record and then Gucci asked, you know, for 100000 and Meech kind of came back, you know, a little strong. That hell no, nah, is this crazy? And then maybe Gucci felt a certain kind of way. But like to this day, Gucci, my man, me and Gucci ain't never had no conversation that he felt a certain kind of way. And that's the reason why him and Gucci got into it. Nah, man, Gucci, was just, him and Jeezy got into it. No, Gucci just was going hard on Jeezy ass, bro. I ain't gonna lie, bro. That's just, I'ma keep it funky, bro. That's what it is, bro. He just was going hard on it. In real life, bro, that Jeezy came with Gucci, bro. No, my it's a two totally different. It's a real street and then Jeezy. I ain't saying he ain't no street, but he ain't that gritty of a street. Like, he ain't ready for that. He ain't doing... When I met Jeezy, he wasn't doing it that Gucci was doing. He wasn't the same kind of person that he was. I know people, bro. You feel me? I was there. I know the two individuals. And exactly what'll happen is what happened. I mean, history tells you what happened. You know what I'm saying ain't no motherfucking joke. I don't give a how Jeezy and them people feel. So what? He'll get on his ass and he'll probably get on anybody that come for him. Just like he did. Hello. There's the proof is in the pudding. I knew he was like, that's why Meech didn't let be a part of the mob. Cause that Gucci crazy, bro. That will f you up. Yeah, all right. Y'all playing with that like he a rapper. He is a rapper. Some of these become rappers, y'all. Some of these was ignorant before rapping and they caught an opportunity. And Gucci will f you up, bro. And, and and like out there in Atlanta, go, I mean, I, bro. Used to drive, I swear to God, bro, I was at the studio at Gucci house. He had a house studio house in his hood. This is when he was Gucci on the moon after all this. After I didn't came back home from prison. And is riding through, busting at this studio while I'm inside the studio. Cause they just know where his studio at in the hood. Like he's that kind of rapper. You feel what I'm trying to tell you? Like he was still in the middle of the street shit for real. Jeezy ass was. Going to kick it with Jay-Z and all that old type shit. You feel me? Being on that level, not saying nothing is wrong with that. Because that's good for a young black man. But when you are street and you say, oh, you comparing to street? That rub elbows with the industry shit ain't with this shit that Gucci going. Gucci staying in the turmoil. They're going, I came home. My stomach got big as Gucci's. I got a picture with me and Gucci standing around with our stomachs. 2013, our stomachs just like this hanging out. Nigga, I'm thin blue now, but our stomachs like this. Atlanta's Motor Speedway, squabbing and shit at night. It was being outside, still outside. He big Gucci and still outside like that. Man, Jay don't, Jay ain't like that. He a real celebrity, celebrity type shit. At one point, Big Meech and Southwest T had a falling out. And I guess the I guess the issues were pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them fell out because T stole three million and left us for dead with the plug. People know this. Everybody acting like they don't know. Man, all that. Southwest T get out. Oh, why you ain't holler that T, man? I don't give a 
about what dog doing, my I sat there and looked at the guns of the Mexican mafia with this actions. I ain't with that. So them been at odds since then, bro. Them don't with each other now. Do anybody see a bunch of reports out there with me sending messages back and forth to his brother? No. He sent him to 50 Cent, but not to Southwest T, bro. Them don't with each other, bro. That is some whole different, bro. You feel me? And then, like, I even got, that's my homeboys that was involved in that shit, and them still be talking to that. Like, I I ain't one of them kind of people, bro. I'm not saying I'm trying to do nothing to the man or none of that. I'm not mad like I was back in the day and shit, but I don't respect that shit. And I don't, even if I forgive you, it don't mean that I forget, and then I just start, and then it's just the way it was. Like, fuck out of here. You was a snake. That shit is snake shit. That shows you what people was capable of doing. Jeezy with the record deal shit and leaving the real out. Let everybody go to prison. That shit flaw. T stole from his old brother three million. That shit flaw. These niggas be having flaws, bro. I ain't saying I ain't got no flaws. I ain't never told on no. They ain't calling my flaws. My flaws is going to be a bitch. Like, yeah, you be sleeping with other bitches when you in a relationship. Them is my kind of flaws. Up out of here, man. I, I ain't with this crazy shit. I always been solid, bro. See, Mish didn't like me like that for no reason. My got to know that. You, you got to know I, I wasn't the nigga living there with him and he growing braids and we running around the whole world throwing money and you go look at shit and you say, tonight is all about Blue Da Vinci. If you love BMF, you love Blue Da Vinci. Everything we doing, if, if Blue Da Vinci don't make it, then BMF don't want to make it. I, not saying that on no camera in no interview that lasts for the rest of lifetime because the he talking about is a whole ass some that be lying or some less than real. This is one of the biggest drug dealers known to African American history in America that we talking about that spoke about me like this at a point in time, nigga. When he was at his height, My, let's keep it one hundred on who Blue is. I just ain't a that just be doing this shit all the time to keep generation for generation up to date and understanding who I am. Now, every once in a while, I'm going to jump outside for a year or something and run around, kick ass and take names. It's what I've been doing for years. Still got all the crews everywhere with all that. I could do all that. I get with all that. But at this point in life, bro, it's shit about family. It's about kids. Like I said, I got kids 28. We trying to see the communities thriving. We trying to make something different happen with the same kind of numbers that we had with BMF. We trying to have a legal BMF rolling. Like, you know what I'm saying? We got some real shit we up to right now. What was it like when they had their falling out? You know, because I believe oh, they we still all wanted to kill them. We wanted to kill T whole side. Big me side wanted to kill T whole side, nigga. And me just like, I'ma handle my brother. Y'all sit chill. I'ma handle my brother. Nobody making no move. I'ma handle my brother. That's what it was. And we had to just deal with it like that. But we didn't chase these out the club in New York before. We come in New York, these are standing in our spot. They don't even be out there like that. They didn't told the people, yeah, this BMF came with all their t-shirts on and shit. And, yeah, this BMF, and they was looking for me and shit. Oh, this is brother T. Oh, I guess y'all can stay up there. They ain't here. Y'all can stand up there then. I don't see no baby blue, no bull, no eel, no throwback, no Tito, no D-Shot, no J-Bo, no big cuz, but it's cool. Y'all can go up there because we know that you meet big, you, we know that you meet little brother. So <clears throat> your big brother being here every week it up with us. We were living in New York at the time. You know what I'm saying? So then we come up in that motherfucker later on that night. Like, who the f they got not? What the f It was one of them things. And then, you know, we, we was we was finna actually just be on it like that for a while. But, you know, them is brothers at the end of the day. So you do got to kind of, when it's a situation like that and it's that close, you kind of, you got to draw back, bro, and let the leader take care of his business as a leader and as a brother. I wouldn't let allow no to move, make no move on my brother no matter what he did. I got to handle my brother for whatever the issue is. I can't let the next do it. So I understood that. I was mad, but I had to take it on the chin and understand it, even though I was under the gun by the Mexican mafia. So it is what it is. Well, at one point, Meech beats his murder case, but this is kind of like a turning point where the feds really oh, yeah, so they turned to... it up. That's when they turned it up. Yeah, after before he even beat the case, after the, after they died, that's when they turned the investigation up. And this is like I said, this is the same month or two when Jeezy signed all the record deals. So when all of that stuff happened, Jeezy has signed all of them deals. So now what happens is simultaneously the investigation increases tenfold on BMF. They're ready to take us down, and he signed the record deals and left. 
That's why I said earlier, had he did the right thing and involved us with those deals, it would have moved us out of the streets into New York, into the high rise with Def Jam and just been doing legal music and been too busy to even try to think about a brick or any of that anymore, period. I would have been in to say Big Meech from the streets. I feel like that's what I was there for. I wasn't there to sell drugs and shit like that. I was there to do music and entertainment. Okay, now... Everything goes down, man. Uh, you know, how do you first start hearing about everybody getting arrested? Shit, I don't know. I don't even remember. I, shit, we was, I don't even remember, bro. I think we was in Miami. They was in Texas. And we just got the call. Like, they just hit Meech. They just picked Meech up. They just hit the crib in, in, in Frisco. They picked him up. And that was it, nigga. That shit just go from there, nigga. They just had to go in action and do what gangsters do. I don't disclose none of that, but you feel me? Did they hit everybody at once? Nah, um, what I believe happened is, nah, see, the told, they did all that telling in 04, and by the time they came back with all the indictments from the grand jury, it was, it was September or something, of 05. You feel me? So once they had the indictments, they just went and hit whatever they hit in different st states. You know what I'm saying? They, it, they was hitting shit for a while. It's like a hundred and something people on that indictment, bro. I didn't get indicted into a whole year after meeting them. You got to think, bro. You didn't hear niggas say, oh, man, Blue Da Vinci told. Hold on, bro. Let's be clear. Big Meechin, 98% of BMF got locked up in October 2005. That's when the indictments hit. From state to state to state. That's when everybody got picked up, right? They got to get picked up to like over a year later. I didn't get indicted to like nine months later and I went on a run and I didn't get picked up to over a year later. I didn't get picked up to almost 07. He went to jail in 2005. I went to jail like December 06. He went to jail October 2005. So you, so, so now say I told, right? But listen to this. If, if, if they went to jail in 2005 and I didn't go to jail to almost 2007, how did I get there? Because I didn't get picked up when they got picked up. So the that told on them initially obviously didn't tell on me then, at least, right? Because they would have picked me up with Meech them. They took all the information to the grand jury, right? That means when Meech got picked up, if the that told on Meech, if whoever told on all them first group of BMF people that got picked up, right? If they would have told on me too, I would have got picked up with Meech them, right? I did not get picked up with Meech and the rest of BMF then. I was still on the streets for over a year, okay? Now, if you understand that, then you can understand this. Them had to tell on me to give the information to the grand jury for me to get picked up, bro. That's what it was. But people don't look at it. People ain't paying attention. And it's so quick that just because a nigga name is more popular than other niggas. Oh, I heard Blue Da Vinci snitch. Oh, you heard that? I heard that. 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 That's what's going on in this day and age. Nigga, it ain't like me, nigga. I'm a gangster. If I say something about it to you, I'm going to send you the paperwork, nigga. I ain't going to say it. I'm going to keep it to myself even if I want to say it bad. I'm going to shut the f up until I got it. And once I got it and I can speak, and I'm only going to speak from a gangster perspective to a gangster. I'm not going to just be running around in the grocery store at the line like, ooh, old white lady, do you know that? Gonna told you was a bitch. Like all that shit, bitch ass shit. I'm cut from a different cloth. I'm cut, I'm cut from the cloth that you got your information on whoever is the rat. And you got it in black and white, and you understand what went on with such case or whatever. You feel me? So, you know, when it come down to me, it's just different. Was Jeezy in the paperwork? Hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just public information. You can look up, look up right now on your phone. Man testifies about Jeezy's cocaine selling. Type in your phone something like that. You're gonna see one of the two name and light, lights, Ralph Sims, the same that told about the limo that. Try to say I told Ralph Sims, Ralphie told on Jeezy, told everything Jeezy ever did. Jeezy had like twelve. Jeezy had more statements on him than me. What you talking about? But no, nah, he didn't get indicted because he did some more other shit. I, I feel like this. I know some things he did. Like he turned me's cars into the feds. They were saying Porsche truck and that Ferrari I was talking about a while before he had went to came to Miami and doing some um, lie detector tests about this gun case he caught. One year in 06 when I went to go meet him, we had a shootout, not against him, but some some other, like when me and him start trying to talk, some other popped it off with us and we end up having a shootout and he ended up going to jail for a gun. If anybody is familiar with that Miami case, him and twin 
went, came back to do a, a polygraph test that's supposed to be for that shit. And the security said that, that Meech cars pulled up on flatbeds, nigga, into the federal building when he went and did it, when he was inside for his meeting or whatever. So I know he turned in the cars. Ain't no telling what people be doing, bro. That's all I know he did. And then he told about House, the gun case that was already thrown out at the state level. And then the, the feds picked it back up. So everybody look up Big House. You look up Big House. He was a security for Jay-Z. He was a security for Big Meech. He was also a security for Young Jeezy. Um, yeah, Jeezy put the people on his ass. And he'll let you know. He, if you look him up, he talking his story. And, you know, you got all these people with these accounts of these people that's out here. Sorry, y'all. I just be the bearer of bad news because it... 10 years go by and people act like they ain't never heard nothing, don't know nothing. Like, hold on, the selective politics shit gotta stop. We off that, nigga. The new BMF coming through, black man's future. We coming here to save the communities and build them back up. Whether you niggas like it or not. Now, uh, Meech gets 30 years. Uh -huh. A lot of people get a lot of time. And you get some time too. Nah, I mean, you could say it like that, but it's 12 people on my indictment that got basically the same time, 10 years and under. So that's the, okay. that's the, see, people got time in the feds, bro, for their role in the conspiracy. People say Meech, Meech got 30 years. You right. He was the leader. He's got a leadership role in the CCE, Continuous Criminal Enterprise. What are we talking about here? Blue Da Vinci got charged with a low level distribution that got knocked down because couldn't prove that I was into the distribution. I got knocked down to a minor role from an average role. So now you're talking about a that got 30 years for being the leader in a continuous criminal enterprise RICO case and that was charged with loading cars with money and drugs, bro. Come on, what is we talking about? Am I supposed to get 30 years? Am I supposed to get with the nigga that's loading cars and counting money getting? I didn't mean it like that. It ain't I was no, just no. It's not directed out. at you. This is what I've been hearing for years. That said the same way. So when you say... Oh, you got me, you got 30 years, and other guys got more time, and then you got five years. Nah, you can't say it like that. You got to say it like this. The leaders got 30, between 20 and 30 years. The uh, average roles got, or the, the, um, the uh, 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 what you call them shits, under the leadership role, the management roles, they got 15 to 25. The average roles got 10 to 15 to 17. The, the uh, minor roles got from five to 10. And then the minimal roles got from zero to two years. It's a federal sentencing guideline, my It's not the state where they just say, oh, you did this and you told and you get this much time then because we say so. It don't work like that, bro. It's the feds, nigga. The feds work on a sentencing grid. Your offense level and your and your and your um, background history, your criminal history and your offense level is on a grid like this. And wherever you fall at on that grid, you get 120 to 256 months. The lower third, the mid and the high end of the sentencing guideline of the federal of the United States of America, nigga, the federal sentencing guidelines. So we all got, we went to the feds. We didn't go to the state. So all of our time was calculated by roles. And your role is calculated by your offense level and what you actually did and what they holding you responsible for. You feel me? So that's how everybody got the time. So if you got a that is a leader and he get five years and he's the leader of a CCE that should be getting 30 years to life, then you go to saying, hey, how the fuck you get five years, bro? Because for your role in the situation, that shit warranted 30 to 80 years, man. How did you get five? Now you go look for a 5K1 or a Rule 35 downward departure or some third party cooperation. And then you get to the just and find out how they got their time cut. Yeah, I'll break this shit down for them. Take these niggas to school today. Yes, sir. I will. Makes I'll sense. Makes sense, man. OK, um, how many people cooperated during this time? A countless. I don't know. There's over 100 people indicted, bro. I got mad statements. I got five CD-ROMs, 16 boxes on five CD-ROMs of paperwork. Oh, this BMF case and that, and that and, and, come on, bro. So many told on this shit and you will never hear their names because don't nobody know none of these, bro. Even if you did hear their name, you wouldn't know who it is. So why do people waste time talking about them? The main snitch on the BMF case, I blast him. His name is William Marshall, AKA Doc. I think he out in Orlando somewhere, but don't nobody ever mention his name. I hear it try to say I snitch and I never told nothing before they mention the main witness on the case. All these niggas that told, don't nobody know who they is, so don't nobody talk about them. They only gonna talk about who popular. That's why most don't talk about Yak and then they'll go talk about Gunner. 
Hello. At one point, you do a song with Fabulous and Jeezy. Uh huh. Streets on lock. What all happens with that song, and and did it get promoted and everything correctly? Like, all right, no, nah, all right. So look, we get some old Jeezy flaw. Uh, all right. So I, I got to take it back a little bit. Once Jeezy didn't sign the record deals, I went with him. I had to revert and go put myself back in the studio and turn into that artist for BMF now since I, we didn't have the main artist for BMF no more since we was working on Jeezy and he ran off and signed the record deals and did his own thing. So now I got to take myself out the president's seat and put myself back in the artist seat for BMF. That's where this record comes from. So I had a real close relationship with Fab at the time. We was I was staying in Miami and I did the record with Streets on Lock was me and Fabulous. So we had recorded the record already. And then, G, you know, me still with Jeezy and shit. I ain't with him, but I couldn't, and it wasn't like I was doing nothing to him or whatever. I just didn't like the no more because I already, he already me. You know what I'm saying? So, but he, with me and them, still cool with him. He was popping at that time. So they was more on, oh, he's a rapper. You can do go to the video, and, you know what I'm saying? Type shit. Then it, it was more groupy shit than real shit like my real it's like man this i was on that time from like 03 up with dog you know what i'm saying so nigga talking about i had something to do with pookie and i didn't even know jeezy at that time i didn't know pookie and none of them guys none of them crips from making i ain't know none of them that that comes after the jeezy with bmf shit that comes a couple years after the jeezy with bmf shit you know what i'm saying two different times you know what i'm saying so like like when that happened it was like, let me, how could I put it? Like, let me see. It's like, he, Jeezy was, Jeezy was just like playing both sides between me and Meech. He knew I wasn't with him, but he still had this relationship with Meech that would enable him to be around and, cause Meech the boss. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, your little man don't fuck with me and shit or whatever, no more that brought me in or whatever. Don't fuck me no more. But me and you cool on the level like you and him cool now, so it really don't matter. And I'ma just play it off like, oh, nigga, you tripping. Oh, man, come on, bro, stop me out. Chill out, man. You tripping. He always played it like that. Well, I was always like, man, fuck out my face, man. Watch out, bro. I ain't, no, nah, I ain't going to that video shoot. No, I ain't going. So he come to the crib one day. He in Miami. He come out to the house. And Fab was there, but he had left, I guess. And we, I had the record, so it was Meech. Man, put Jeezy on it, man. I gotta hear him on it with y'all, man. Y'all three. I gotta hear him on it. All three of y'all, I gotta hear him on it. I'm like, bro, I do not even want this nigga on my song. Even though he was already signed and already had dropped the music on Def Jam, it would have been a good look, you know what I'm saying, for me anyway. And that's probably part of the reason why I didn't even argue with, with Meech about that shit, too. But I didn't want him on that record at all. It was just supposed to be me and Fabulous on that Streets on Lock record. And I was supposed to go to New York. And it was supposed to be some L.A. and New York shit. And that was supposed to be it. And then me just at the house rolling on them pills. I got the big ass K-Series SSL in my house at the time and shit. Oh, man, I want to hear Jesus, man. Put him on that motherfucker, man. Put him on it. Come on, Blue, dog, for me. Put that nigga on there for me, dog. Come on, my nigga. He hit me with one of them up. So I, right, man, go here. Load this shit up for this nigga. So that jumped on there and he jumped on the streets on lock record right so now mind you i'm speeding up i didn't did the label launch because he didn't sign and hurry up and launch my shit rushed it and launched it i had a because now the shooting didn't happen mind you the shooting didn't happen so now i know the investigation on so i'm trying to rush everything go get a deal all fast and hurry up before the feds come get us you understand what i'm saying so instead of trying to do it the right way like how i was doing it with him, I got to rush and go to independent way and go to Koch and get a deal right quick and do all that. So I did that and made an album and shit, trying to hurry up and get that shit out. And we, I pushed the record out. It was on Koch. It was getting promoted and all the shit. Um, it was getting promoted correctly. All the numbers was right. I was like 300 and some spins a week on my BDS at the time. And I got a call. From my team, it was like, bro, they talking about, it was a, like a Tuesday. I think it was a Tuesday, if I am mistaken. I was in, I was on the road on my tour bus and I got a call from my team and they said that on Thursday in two days, they gonna pull the record from radio. 
if they don't get Jeezy and CTE signature. They wasn't signed off for the record. So I'm like, what? I'm like, all right, hold on, bro. Let me call this and blah, blah, blah. So I called it. And this wasn't the first time I called him about that. It was already mentioned before they dropped the shit. So they dropped it and we still didn't have the signatures. And I think it was dropped on good faith that we was going to get the signatures from Alan Grumblad at, at Koch. They got the shit. They worked it out with Clear Channel or whatever. So, uh, you know what I'm saying? So the record could stay up there and they was and they was telling them that they going to have the paperwork or however it went. But them motherfuckers, I, I called Jeezy. He told, he swear up and down to God in heaven. He signed off and all this shit. But <coughs> I had my signature. Then my signature for BMF Entertainment as the owner. Then we had Alan M's signature from Koch. Then we had uh, John Jackson, which is a fabulous name as an individual, fabulous, the artist. Then we had Skane and Clue for Desert Storm was signed off. I had those signatures. I saw them with my eyes. Then I had I think I had, at this time, was Jay Brown's signature from Def Jam. He was the vice president of Def Jam at that time. I believe his signature was on my record for Def Jam or whatever. And um, everybody was signed off except for Jeezy and CTE. So they pulled my record from radio in the middle of my marketing for the single. And then once they pulled it, once they pulled it, I went to... I went to my, I flew to my brother got killed. I was hot as fuck, mad at Jeezy. My brother died. In the daytime, I, I, my brother went to at, at Atlanta from off my tour bus. I was in South Carolina. He got killed that night on some other shit. I'm already mad. I didn't have the conversation with Jeezy in the daytime about my record. So now that my brother died, the next day I talked to him, I'm like, bro, where you at? I'm just going to pull up. I left my tour route and drove the bus all the way to Miami to go have a conversation with Jeezy about the record being signed off. And that's when that shootout happened that I was just talking about previously. I went to talk to him about that record. That's what the conversation was about. I was coming to meet him and confront him about the shit with all of this shit with me. And before, as soon as we start talking, Tula was walking down the street with dreads and they're like, oh shit, there go Jeezy dog. And they're like, oh, and blue, that Jeezy and blue nigga, that's BMF right there, nigga. Oh, bro, let us get a picture. And then my little cousin twin, big twin, he like, oh, nigga, they ain't taking no pictures. You see, they trying to talk, so the little nigga like, well, then? And then the twin fired him, boom. And that's what started that shit that ended up to the shootout. And me and him never talked about the record right there because that fight turned into a shootout, turned into we all ran, turned into Jeezy got locked up for the gun. And then later on, Jeezy went back to have a polygraph test about that situation. That was all about that day I went to meet him to talk about why he didn't sign off on my record with me, him, and Jeezy, and they pulled it from the radio. And I believe he couldn't because the feds had jacked him and told him, nigga, if you help these niggas in any same reason why he couldn't do the deal with us. Same reason why he couldn't put his name on the contract because the contract ensues help to BMF and they struck his ass down and told him they were going to put your ass in prison. If you continue to help Big Meech and Blue in that BMF shit, you're going to fully pull away from that shit. Like, there ain't nobody else stop quitting the mob. He the only in history that just stopped, stopped claiming the mob. Nigga, who the fuck stopped claiming the mob? I might don't put all them that think they claim the mob, but I am the mob. I never stop claiming BMF, whether it's BMF Originals, BMF Entertainment Music. I make all of the sub brands to the brand because I created the brand. Them niggas just had a name. I made it famous with his money. I ain't saying I was the biggest dope dealer that sold all the dope and went in. Nah, nigga, I'm just a mastermind that make you be able to know it today. So, yeah, that's what happened with that record. He me over and never signed off on the record and they pulled it from radio and it f***ed up that whole deal and I ended up going to prison from that point. I went on a run from off that tour. Before I even finished the tour, my paperwork came out. They indicted me. Okay, now now you go to jail. You uh -huh. do your time. How much did you do? About, what, four, four and a half years? I got five years, four months. So, um, bro, I, I signed a plea agreement for 109 months. I signed to the lower third of the sentencing guideline, I signed to 109 months. I qualified for the safety valve. A lot of people talk about this safety valve and they say you got to tell to be awarded the safety valve. Now, to break that down, because that's one that we missing that I need to, but this is the time for it. So when I come through my shit, bro, what happened with me is they was holding me at an average roll when I got arrested. They was holding me responsible for the sale of 150 kilos or more of uh, cocaine, okay? That was my charges. 
a conspiracy with intent to distribute 150 kilos of more or of more or more of cocaine. And I was held at an average row, like I said, which which is my offense level, which puts me at 74, I believe, on the sentencing guideline on the grid. That's where it t- takes me from zero and one to 74 or whatever it is, I believe, or 34 or whatever it is. It puts me there from that charge. OK, that's what they charged me with. And I signed my plea for 109 months. I was awarded the safety valve. Now, the safety valve has two articles. Article one, you can qualify for the safety valve by cooperating in a timely manner, not cooperating with the government against a a defendant. Okay, not snitching or telling cooperating in a timely manner means the government presents you with information that they have against you in their affidavit of indictment. And they're explaining to you why they indicted you. These people said these things about you. We took it to the grand jury. They issued us an indictment. And here we are today. Okay, so out of the 11 statements that are here, you have to admit to 11 statements. If not, then you could zip your shoes up. You're going we're going to take you to trial because you're not cooperating to cooperate with the government means that when they tell you what these people told on you and they telling you what they charging you with, you can't argue with them. If you argue with them, try to say, no, I didn't do that. He lying. He lying. All right, then get your attorney together. We going to trial then. We'll figure this out in court. That's how the courting system goes. You know, feel me? And when they say you did this and you did that, you say, uh-uh, you lying, then you got to go to trial. Or you sign a plea agreement, which is an agreement agreeing that what they putting in this affidavit, you did. Okay? And that's cooperating with the government. When you do not cooperate with the government, you tell them, Oh, I ain't do none of this shit, bitch. Take this shit to trial, ho. I'm going to trial, bitch. You're not being cooper- cooperative, okay? We said you did this. You said you didn't. You ain't cooperating? All right, we finna try to take you and give your ass a thousand years then, bitch, since you don't want to cooperate. Just because they say cooperation, it does not mean telling. People got to understand that as a people. They get this, these terms up. Just because in another sense, cooperating does mean cooperating with the police and getting people in trouble and doing 5K1 downward departures and Rule 35 downward departures and that kind of cooperation to wiggle yourself out of something is different. When you just get in trouble and charged with something, nigga, and you sign your plea agreement in a timely manner, that's called cooperation as per Article 1 of the safety valve, okay? So, number one is the cooperation in a timely manner, meaning pleading guilty in a timely manner. I could have just said it like that, but they word it as cooperating. They don't say he played out in a timely manner. It don't word like that. It words that he cooperated in a timely manner. That's how it words. So we got to school these people so they understand the terminology to know that this is because they said cooperating. It don't mean he said snitch. Now, hold on. Now, the next part about this safety valve is no criminal history. Your criminal history has to be zero, meaning you've never been in trouble or never had a felony, never been to jail before. At 27 years old, by the time I went to the feds, it was my first time ever going to the, getting a felony. My nigga was my first defense, bro. And then the number three qualification to be awarded the safety valve without telling is you have to uh uh wait is is plea out in a timely manner is number two and then number three to qualify is no violence in the in the in your charges or gun. So if I got a gun or violence, I'm not eligible for the safety valve unless I use article two and tell and cooperate with the government and do a Rule 35 or 5K1 downward departure. Then I could be awarded the safety valve. What the safety valve does is it enables the judge to go outside of the sentencing guidelines. It also enables you to get a year off of your sentence by completing a 500-hour residential drug program that everybody that go to the feds that get qualified for it, that qualifies for it, tries to take. That's the big thing in the feds. As soon as you get there, bro, you getting a year off, you getting a year off, you getting a year off, you getting a year off. Everybody want to know who getting a year off from the drug program in the feds. So it's a big thing in the feds, the drug program. It ain't nothing but a bunch of classes for 500 hours while you in prison doing your time, right? So those three things awarded me the safety valve. I qualified. I didn't have to go to Article 2 of the safety valve and become a rat or an informant or tell. So people try to say, yeah, but they took you to a debriefing and you had to tell them everything you knew. But this is where people was wrong at. Because if you back up this whole story and and you remember that I told you that this told in 2004, they picked up, he started telling the story in 2004. They picked up Big Meech and Southwest T and all of the rest of them, 89, 98, 
in 2005. And then I got, and that's when the whole story was told. Okay. That's when the story was told. And then I got picked up in 2006 at the end of it, almost 2007. So many had told by the time I got to prison, there was nothing left to tell, even if I did want to tell. And that's what exactly what my lawyer told him. People, well, if Blue, even if Blue wanted to tell, he ain't got nothing to tell. All these told y'all everything. They didn't tell so much. They didn't tell shit. Blue didn't even know. Is what my lawyer saying to the government. Y'all talking about, do he got some information? Now y'all know good and damn well y'all got way more information than Blue got with all these that y'all done arrested. Hell no, nah, Blue ain't got no more information. These fuck niggas done told it all to y'all already. That was my standpoint when I got locked up. Bro, y'all been into this case for, for well over two years now. Y'all know I ain't got no information that y'all didn't know. Even if I did, bitch, I ain't giving it up. I ain't have to say that to him. I ain't have to say even if I do know that about this, know about that, I ain't telling y'all. I didn't taunt the government or no shit like that. I just said, hey, bro, from all this shit that y'all showed me that these said, it ain't nothing for me to tell y'all if I wanted to tell y'all something, bitch. That's it. I ain't got no information for y'all. Y'all, I'm reading shit in this shit that I didn't even no, y'all telling me some shit about the that I didn't even know. Y'all got all the information already. See, that was my standpoint when I even come in to prison, bro. So when I got there in front of the judge, it was like, well, did Mr. McKnight cooperate? Yeah, he timed, he uh, timed out in a in a in a timely manner. He I mean, he played out in a timely manner, and he just didn't have any information that available for the government that would have been substantial or, or led to an arrest. Anything that he knows about the BMF situation has already been told by all these that's already been in jail a year and a half before him. That's what they could have said, but they don't talk like in the courtroom. They use professional terms. And shit, you know what I'm saying? They could have just said, look, all these, my lawyer could have said, all them up that y'all locked up that told on Blue and got Blue indicted, they told y'all whole story. It wasn't, what would y'all want Blue to come here and tell the exact same story that they did? It ain't no more story to tell. He ain't got nothing else to tell. They told everything and they told everything about him. And now here he is. He just going to take his time and go. That's it. That was my standpoint when I came through. It was no information available for the government. It was no, oh, yeah, I know about. Try to put the limo on me. Oh, like I told the government. Oh, he told about this limo. That's what he told on. We can't find the paperwork, but he told about a limo. That's what he told on. Even Big Meech said it. Oh, man, Blue told about a limo. Blue told about a limo. Blue told about that limo. Blue told about that limo. The next thing you know, ask me on the interview on my Instagram. Nigga, they said you told about a limo. I'm on Instagram arguing. Shut your bitch ass up on my shit, nigga. Fuck wrong with you, nigga. Ralphie told about that limo, dickhead. Y'all need to shut the fuck up. Y'all know what y'all talking about. Before y'all talk, find the paperwork. All you got to do is look up who told about the black limo with a million dollars on it on BMF. Look it up on, on the internet. One saying I did it. His name is... They had the Black Mafia book. His name is Salsa. They, he could change his name to Salsa Dexter. So Dexter has a book in which he put another paperwork on me, put my picture right next to the paperwork, named Ralph Sims paperwork, and says in the book, Blue Da Vinci told about the limo, put my picture next to the limo that got found and everything, and the paperwork. And the paperwork don't say my name in it. It don't say nothing about my name, my real name, my blue name, none of that. It talk about Meech the whole time, and it's a nigga named Ralph Sims that's telling it. But you got in the media dragging my name through the mud like I'm some kind of snitch, boy. And they, they don't understand. I will punish these niggas for real while I'm staying in the house chilling with the kids. So I go to prison punishing one of these niggas for what they playing with. Anyway, my bad. Why would Sosa, uh, you know, I, I remember he seeing retarded. that part. That He halfway retarded. He ain't, he like really for real, like not making a joke. Like he really slow, like type shit. Like he ain't all the way there. And then he like 65, 64, he an older. So, you know, he doing it for clout. He in this social media age. He had, he was the last left with the BMF bomber jackets. So when we was all in jail and he got out, that was putting on the jackets and the black dark glasses. And yeah, I'm, I own BMF now. I don't give a fuck what me saying. He one of them, man, like that, that old, he wasn't nothing but a driver. Like, that nigga ain't do nothing but be on the road again. That nigga ain't bust no ass. He ain't bust no shot. That nigga ain't do shit but drive back and forth and not know what was in the tank. That's it. And it's cool for him. You just need to understand how to just do what they do and stay in their lane. Because mention my name because it makes it brings them notoriety. Don't nobody know who the fuck this is until they start mentioning Meech and Blue and having something controversial to say. Now you get people to go, look, and go make you some money. So I come with the defamation and take that shit. It's all good. I ain't tripping. I ain't hurting. 
It's all good. I'm a gangster, bro. I know what I know what I'm out here doing and what I didn't did. Trust me, bro. This from man to man, from me to you. This ain't even about y'all in interview land. This from me to dog. Hey, nigga, if I would have told you, I would have been so in the house all these years, bro. I would have never been able to show my face again, bro. I'd have been too embarrassed, bro. I'm that type of like I had to. I got the hoodie on and this hat on because I ain't gonna get my hair braided for this shit, bro. I'm too embarrassed to show my hair. I couldn't show my face if I told nowhere. Nigga, I stay in drop tops outside for years since I've been home on tour buses, putting on, doing the whole shit, still kicking ass and taking names, still having 20, 30 on the street moving around. Like, come on, bro. These niggas is really off in that camera into their phone device. They ain't really out here in the real world. We're going to bring them on in, though. Yeah. Now, you get out of jail. And did you and Meech have any communication? Are you guys still cool at this point? What, when I came home or are we going back to what, where we are? When I came home, yeah. When I came home from prison, me and Meech was talking all the time. So he would be, like, he'd get moved around from prison to prison. He'd be in a holdover or something. He'd catch a cell phone and then he'd catch my jack and we'd be talking. You know what I'm saying? I'd be out in the club putting him on the phone with celebrities when I would be out. We had a regular. I'll send the baby mom, baby mama money for the son, for little Meech. Expensive ass school. And I, my kids going to public school. My kid wasn't even in private school. And I'm, I'm sending money multiple thousands. Not, I might didn't do it a whole bunch of times, but I know I did it once or twice. And that's like 10, 15,000 for that, for his school. I'm doing it like that when I came home. But me, me, it was still, everything was still perfect when I came home. It was supposed to just be right back on when I came home. So like he had said I told, but then the paperwork came out and then he knew who it was. He apologized. We got over that in 2008. So we had been over that in 2008. You feel me? Over him saying publicly that I told. Me said that before out of his mouth to people on the phone while he was in prison. You feel me? But then when the paperwork hit the street and could catch up on that gangster and then see, oh, shit, this Ralphie told about this shit, man. I done said this shit about Blue. Damn. Hey, bro, Blue ain't said that shit. Nigga, that was Ralphie. That was Ralphie. Now all the homies got it. That was Ralphie. That was Ralphie. But now how am I looking at all of the homies? That was my homies that was looking at me like I told because me said that and they just taking it for face value instead of having some paperwork. Nobody had no paperwork because if anybody had the paperwork, they would be like, nigga, this say this Ralph Sims got on the stand and did this. Nigga, this ain't got nothing to do with Blue. Why y'all saying Blue said it? Ain't nobody never checked. Nobody did none of that. Everybody just ran with the damn, bro. That's crazy. I can't believe Blue did that. Blue did that all the way until the paperwork came out. So how long did that take? And how many people had heard that and got that message before the paperwork actually came out? And these start correcting they self and shit. It was the damage is already done, right? Smut my name just like that. Just because he's so big and out of his mouth. People just take. He's so popular and so respected that they just take what he say for face value. I don't care how big get, bro. How gangster you think a nigga is, bro. When it comes to this gangster shit, this shit about black and white, bro. The shit paperwork, bro. People get killed about this shit, bro. For real, for real. Not often, but people still do die about this shit, bro. You can't play with no people's name like that. You ain't seen that paperwork. You seen it, you still shouldn't do it if you ain't involved with it. But if you just got to be a bitch-ass nigga and be talking about like how all these is these days, then go ahead and hire you some up paperwork to support whatever point that you're making. Every time I drop jewels, I got paperwork or it's business. If it ain't business and it's some street shit and it's negativity, then it's paperwork involved. If not, it ain't nothing to rap about. Whatever happened to them rules, that should have been definitely with the boss of BMF, the owner, the main head honcho. He should be the first nigga to like, hold on, the mob don't move like that. I don't give a fuck what nobody said. Nigga got to show me that paperwork. Let me hit my lawyer and have my lawyer draft me up what came from this situation and he got the power. You can call an attorney. Like, I called my attorney and got it done. I ain't Big Meech. I had that shit started, man. Had my people make 17 copies of that shit and was blasting it out to people, nigga, to BMF members' families' houses. Like, yeah, nigga, let everybody know. Nigga, put that shit in orange highlighter. Who told about that limo? Because this is crazy. I'm going to have to kill somebody about it. Come to me and my face like, hey, nigga, you, didn't you tell about it? You a, t you a snitch, nigga. You told about that limo. <sighs> I'm going to try to get off. Cause my name, bro, it's all I got. My, my run down on me while I'm with my son. Nigga, you a rat. We don't fuck with rap. Pop, pop, pop. I got my eight-year-old with me. You feel me? I only supposed to just sit there and be like, all right, guys, whatever you say. I don't and you 
they ain't even talking about the that's really telling. And half of you niggas that's saying it didn't told is the crazy part about it. Half that's be saying the shit be that done told. Done been told. Not new tellers. Old tellers. Nigga, man, stop playing. These niggas be weird as fuck. All right, let's go. Now, uh, you guys were cool when you got out of prison. And at one point, you guys have a falling out? No, nah, we never had a falling out. Nope. Okay. If you look at the song that I did, Got Right, in 2013 or 14 or whatever year it was, it was the Jeezy diss. After Jeezy did the song Get Right, and he put a line in there for me. He said, acting ass nigga was in, was in three strikes. That line, I played in three strikes. I co-starred in it. He said, I heard him singing to the judge. They said he sang to the judge, gave him three mics. All right? That was his line for me. So I did a whole diss record called Got Right. Talking shit. Talking about him turning the cars into the feds and all the shit. All right? So when I did that Got Right record, that was that time. You feel me? So Big Meech is on that record, nigga, on an excerpt at the end of it, going hard on Jeezy. Talking about how to telling people we giving them 200,000 bitch ass nigga you ain't never gave me no 200,000 and you try boy you go listen to the song got right y'all ain't heard got right or seen the video go look up the video blue da vinci got right right now you see og rest two two of my recipes og homies one from east coast one i know one of my og homies from bmf and shit they both passed away uh Right, two old ass OGs with me in the video and shit you know what I'm saying and I was shooting that Jeezy the whole time and shit when I was in Atlanta and he trying to come out pop outside like we both can't be out here you saying shit about me on the song trying to catch up with you get up with you so I did a record okay and but at some point you and Big Meech stopped talking yeah so we stopped talking me and B me and Meech last time talking was 2017 right so in 2017, um, we on the phone like normal, regular conversation one night. And then my homeboy that was with me, he was like uh, Tone Bird. He from BMF too. Tone was like, ask Big Homie what's up with the movie with 50. Like, what's going on with he from New York? I had to use my New York accent. Yo, what's going on with the, the 50 Cent movie? So I'm like, oh, yo, Mish, what's up with this with the movie, with the TV show? Like, where y'all at with that? He like, oh man, it's almost done. The contract almost done. It's almost done. We're gonna be starting. They're gonna be, you know, starting to um, cast it or whatever, whatever, right? He like, I just gotta wait to holler at Tammy before, you know what I'm saying? I know where we at with that. And Tammy is a government informant. So when he said that, I was like, Tammy, what you mean, Tammy? Like, you ain't heard what's going on with her? And they were like, shit, nigga, I heard some shit, but whatever it is, that shit ain't got shit to do with me. And he's like, man, I'm gonna hit you back. I'm like, all right, that's the last time I ever talked to him. Next time I talk, I ain't even talked to him. Next time my cousin talked to him and said that he wanted, he was trying to get on the phone with me while I'm getting into it with Lil Meech. Lil Meech came into one of the stores that I was working with, one of the exotic rental stores to rent a car one time and was talking shit, start talking crazy shit about me, nigga. And my son was in there working at the time too. I'm gonna have my son whoop his ass and let the kids lock up. You know what I'm saying? I was mad as a but, you know, all this shit just end up stemming from a whole nother situation that was surrounding me that was going on and shit. So, you want, so why, you want to pull up some paperwork? You want me to show you how to pull up some paperwork? So you're talking about Tammy Cowens, right? Yeah, yeah, Tammy Cowan. Okay, now... She, she's a co-producer of the BMF Stars TV show. Okay, and, and you're saying that she's an informant? Definitely, 100%. Okay. She's been an informant since 2009. Okay, so I'm on the page right now. Yeah, it's 32 and pages or something. I'm on, I'm on the first page, and now it says, uh, you know, United States of America versus plaintiff, and it says uh, Donnie Gatlin, Deion Gatlin, Deion Gatlin, shout out Deon Cuff, Gatlin. shout out Cuff. That's my Cuff, Deion Gatlin. Yeah, he's one of the first defendants, yeah. Okay. St. Louis Project. What's happening? So, can you kind of break down this paperwork for me and how she's involved in this? And wh where can I go? I to mean, look at uh, uh, Tammy Tammy Cowens is 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 Big Meech personal assistant slash business partner slash whatever you want to call. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, uh, 
basically she became the owner of Meech's, what Meech has as BMF Entertainment, his company from prison. His company, she became the owner of it in 2008. And in 2009, she became a government informant. 2010, she did a case that was uh, pertaining to a, a guy that Meech met in prison and one of Meech's homeboys of 26 years. Okay. Now, in this paperwork, it doesn't actually say her name. Right, right. Yeah, you, you will have to... Um, you you it, it don't it don't got a, it don't say her name. It, it say her name on paper on a cover sheet, her actual name. But you know this is a this is a case, so they're not gonna be saying the witnesses' names in the case. They're gonna call them CS one or CSOI or something like that, confidential source or whatever. It's confidential, bro. It's not public. That you know what I'm saying the the snitch on the case is not public. You feel me? Until maybe after the case and the people's put away in prison and they oughta. Uh, uh, government hiding and all that shit and then you get some paperwork and then you might see it. Outside of that, you got to be tapped in. You got to have that pacer. You got to be able to pull cover sheets and shit like that. But when people read the affidavit, it explains to you exactly who she is. And then when people follow or know, or once you get to understand this situation, then you'll get to see exactly who Tammy Cowens is. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit, a little part of it real quick, man. It says CS1's relationship with Flonery, Suarez, and Gatling. When CSI became a DA informant, CSI was and had been a longtime associate of Demetrius Flonery. Yeah. Now, here's where it says uh, CSI1 held Flonery's power of attorney and life rights with creative control. So... Yeah, that means she's the person that got his life right. So she's the person that 50 Cent got the movie from, the TV show from. That's the only way to get it. You can't get it from Meech because he in prison, so he can't DBA. He can't do business from prison. He's in jail. So he has to sign his rights to do his life story or do whatever he going to do in his name over to somebody else. And Tammy Cowens is the person that was appointed to do all of that business. And she's the one that got the deal with 50. Okay, and... How exactly did she cooperate or inform on people? Well, in that in that paperwork, it says that uh, in 2009, she became an informant and she smashed somebody else, some dude named Terry White out of Atlanta. The government awarded her $50,000 because it was an open and shut case. Um, and then in 2010, she started this case, which was a pay, well, she became a paid DEA informant. For this case with me, she got over $300,000, bro. To do this, there's a wiretap case. Them 32 pages you looking at, it's a wiretap case, bro. It's a third party cooperation case. And with, and when she went on a visit to Meech and he told her to run this drug play and she went and hooked the feds up to it. But the, but the feds that she hooked up to it ended up being the same agent that locked us all up, special agent Jack Harvey. So now you start connecting all the dots. Oh, that's who put Meech in jail. So it's looking like Meech put him with his personal assistant slash person that he's doing all his business for him. She did the legal business for the movie shit, but she also did the dirty business for him too on the other side and got paid to do it. She wasn't in trouble. She wasn't in the feds, in jail. She's not a co-defendant or any defendant of any kind. She's just a regular working middle class, I mean, middle-aged lady. You know what I'm saying? And she did it to get that out. That's what she did it for. She even said it on the stand in the paperwork. It tell you in the paperwork. She said she did it to get me out. She tried to say he didn't know or whatever or something, but it was too late. She had already told everything. She started fucking the agent and all kind of shit. Y'all just got to read it, man. She like a love story. Tap in. Yeah, that shit crazy, bro. This is the shit that people don't be knowing, man. It take real to come out to enlighten motherfuckers, give y'all motherfuckers something to talk about for a little while. Keep my dick out your mom. Okay, so just looking over this paperwork a little bit, it says that Big Meech requested uh, CS1's help coordinating delivery of a load of cocaine to be controlled by Suarez. All right, so stop right there. Fuck all the questions then. There we go. Damn, what is, hold on, say that one more time. In September of 2011, Big Meech requested CS1's help coordinating delivery of a load of cocaine to be controlled by Suarez. All right, so no matter if we knew that CS1 was Tammy Cowens or not, it don't matter no more, right? Because we do know that Big Meech ordered a shipment of kilos through a 
confidential informant, right? That's All right, so says, now yes. I'm the one that's telling you motherfuckers who the confidential informant is. Now everybody can do their investigation and find out. When you find out that the confidential informant is the person that own, that has his life rights, that his life rights are signed over to, and you look up the person, who is Big Meech life rights signed over to? And you go probably find her name. Who owns Big Meech life rights? Her name got to pop up somewhere because her name is all on the production shit for that, for that star shit. I didn't find reports that got it. I got clips of her on the red carpet with her saying that she got to deal with 50 Cent in 2012. OK, and with her on the red carpet last year on stars and that paperwork with you, that clip right there, what you just read is it connects everything. It tells you it tells you who the lady is and then we can see who the lady is to this day. Point blank, period is third party cooperation. And that's the point, period. At the end of the day, Cuff doing 26 years, the, 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 the confidential informant start having sex with the federal agent. It was conspiracy, I mean, uh, infidelity in the case. They threw the case out. That's why Meech ain't get out. But they still kept cuffed. They superseded him because they heard something else happen while they was on the wiretap that didn't have nothing to do with the shit they was investigating uh, for Meech and them. Something totally happened in a whole nother state. And they charged him for it. And it superseded indictment. Didn't have nothing to do with that one. Throw that one out. But we keeping you. Everybody else could go. We keeping you because we heard this happen on the phone while we was listening, bruh. So now, nah, Meech, we ain't gonna give you the credit for it, but your ass stand for 26 years, and they go cuff in there for 26 years. So you're still in contact with Suarez? I don't know Suarez. No, I know Gatling. Oh, okay. Yeah, Suarez is the Mexican plug. I don't know him. But Dion Gatlin is cuff. He been Meech friend for 26 years. His brother was Wani. Magic was part of BMF. Cuff was in jail when we was doing all the BMF shit, but him and Meech and them been cool since the 80s. Sometime, you feel me? So he came home. He's trying to do get land a movie deal with that uh, with the lady who had the life rights, and that's how he knew her. So then he had he put them together at it as it pertained to the Spanish dude, and then that's how Cuff got caught up in that with that situation. You feel me? It's all bad though, bro. It's not good news. None of it is good news. That case that you pulled up with that red docket number, it's a cover sheet that goes to that page that tells you what's inside of that packet. And it tells you all of the people, it tells you the defendants, it gives the, everybody, it gives the whole, it's, it's, it's a cover sheet. And the cover sheet tell, it says the name of the actual informant and it tells you here and after in this affidavit, this person will be named CSOI or COI or CI, however they name it, they, they, you know, they take the name off. So don't know who the snitch is. The reason, this is how they found out who the, who, who, who the girl was, bro, who was telling. The mo Cuff's baby mother, okay? Cuff's daughter contacted me, how I figure out all this, okay? She the one that first contacted me. Her mom, this lady is like 20 some years old, 30 maybe. Her mom put a private investigator on the people or whatever and found that the infidelity, the man recorded the people staying overnight with each other at hotels and all kind of shit from state to state. OK, so they put them on on the stand in, in court and they admitted the shit. It's all in that paperwork. They admitted that they had the sexual relationship and everything. So it was up the whole case. Now it's infidelity in the case. They can't take the bitch's statements and shit no more because she didn't fuck the agent. You feel me? So they threw it out. That's why Meech never got out. But now people are like, well, then why did the other dude still get time then? If Meech didn't get out and it got thrown out, why did the dude get 25 years? because they did a superseding indictment and he got in trouble for something that they heard during the wiretap that didn't have nothing to do with that drug deal. So the other people didn't get in trouble for this. This is something that he did on his own time and they locked up him and some other people for that, for a murder of a government witness that they heard it happen on his phone. So they just did a superseding indictment while, you know, since they heard it and they was finna all get off. He felt like they wanted him anyway more than the Mexican Mafia dude. They were trying to pin him anyway. They wanted Cuff. That's how he feel. You feel me? So as soon as they had him, they like, oh, yeah, we finna nail Cuff ass. And they got out on him. Right when that shit went bad for, for Meech and them and the shit was all going out of court. And people if people realize, man, in 2018, it start going uh, viral that Big Meech was finna come home from jail. All right. It's like March or May or May 24th or something like that. 2018. It was going viral right before Barack Obama came out of office. Some people were saying that Barack was finna give him a pardon. 
some people were saying that, you know, he was getting out for other reasons, COVID and all of this shit. But then he never got out and they just stopped saying it. It just went away from the Internet. And during that time of that push of that, you know, for shit like that to go viral, it's got to get inserted to the bloodstream of the Internet. It takes some powerful shit for that to happen. You just can't post something and it's just viral. You know what I'm saying? The shit don't really work like that. You know what I'm saying? So it was a it was a powers that be behind that that marketing campaign of him coming home, but he ended up not coming home. And then once you look at the paperwork and see how shit read, they don't get no leniency for the shit because the people didn't get convicted of the charge for the drugs and the money that was found during that investigation. So that's why he's still sitting there. And that's why people will argue all day like, oh, he ain't do shit, man. Why he's still in jail then? If he worked with the people, he would have got out. And all this shit is you got to understand and read. That's why you got paperwork. You can't you can't guess and assume. I didn't know none of this shit at one point in time until the young lady called me talking about Uncle Meech is a rat. And I'm like, why? Hold on. Watch your motherfucking mouth. Like, what you talking about? You got to have some paperwork before you say shit like that. She she got me that paperwork. And then when I read it, I still was looking like, man, this shit look like this lady said, meet you. Let me wait. See if they charge him with something. A year go by. Another year go by. The case was already years old. I got onto it in 2015. It went to 2017 when I asked him. What's up with that? He said, tell me name. And I said, damn, you ain't heard what's going on with her. And he told me, whatever it is, ain't got shit to do with me. Got off the phone with me. That's the last time I ever talked to him again. So obviously he knew I knew. I told him I had the paperwork and shit. And I just wanted to make sure he knew what was going on because I wasn't even sure if he even knew. You know what I'm saying? Like that, like what was it? He had to, but I was still questioning because that's my man. Like I'm trying to ride with my man. You feel me? So I'm like, nah, man, hell nah. This shit, nah. She trying to smash him, bro. She trying to him up like why is he in there even doing this dumb ass shit all this good shit he got going on I couldn't even understand it and it makes sense I'm like he's smarter than this he know he got a whole TV show be, getting ready to be produced and he doing this but when you get the paperwork man that shit stand back to 2010 <laughs> before they even thought about doing a TV show with motherfucking 50 Cent they was already tied in with the people it was already going you know what I'm saying 50 Cent came into it that shit was already the investigation was already two years old you know what I'm saying? So that's why I end up how it is. You know what I'm saying? But people need to know. They need to know who they working with. They, you need to know who you calling a gangster, who you holding your pledge to. All that shit need to be known, bro. We can't be honoring this flaw no more, man. It's got to stop. It's the only way we're going to fix ourselves as a people and be able to resurrect these hoods and do the right thing and start good businesses and having these kids learn how to be business owners and owning our own. That's what we got to be on, bro. If we ain't on that, we ain't on. Straight up. All this gangster. And court and who told and all this shit is cool. It's what y'all want to hear. But that ain't really what I'm on, bro. I'm on trying to figure out how I can have a whole bunch of money and all y'all can have a whole bunch of money so we could all just be out here lit. It's possible. If you follow the right lead, you know what I'm saying? With the right people, share the right business. That's what we supposed to be on, my for real. I'm here for that message, for real. I ain't I ain't come out the woodworks. I could have did all this last year it had to make sense for me to even come talk people trying to slander my name 50 cent all these last year i didn't come out they try to cut up a video of me being on instagram live on my live on instagram and cut up a video like i was going on a rant against me and all of these people or the tv show and all that and all i was doing was answering the question that somebody asked me on my instagram bro because when i go on a rant it sounds totally different shit got paperwork coming out i might be waving guns like my rants is so different than what they called a Blue Da Vinci rant. It's crazy. Like, y'all niggas ain't never watched Smack DVDs? See me going to rant before? I mean, I got the real original rants. I rant threaten your ass to death. Make you have to come outside and check this shit. You got to after I get done with a rant. I ain't going no rant. I just said the truth, bro, and the truth can never be considered disrespect. I told him then it's only one way to tell that story. If you're telling Big Meech's story, you tell it whatever way you want to. How they turn it with me running in the police station with Uzis and people that was men in his life that they turned into women as the character. All kind of crazy shit going on for their dramatization to make the shit good because they don't have enough information and they can't pull the shit that's good enough out to just make good TV with the real information. Like if I was doing a BMF TV show, it would, first of all, it wouldn't be Black Mafia Family. It would be BMF Entertainment Incorporated because that's what you all know. You all know the cars, you all know the jury, you all know all of the in the club throwing the money, and that's me and my homeboys. That was BMF ENT, every trusted. It's the tattoo that's on our neck. I think it's entertainment. That's on paper. But for that original BMF crew that kicked ass and took names, nigga was every trusted. So any that say no ENT, you dissing the original set. 
Yeah. That's what the BMF shit was. BMF, ENT, every trusted. That's the original BMF that got put on shirts and on 30, 40 with all the foreigners driving up and down the street. Now, the BMF with Meech was the only one with a chain on in 88. That didn't exist. There was no BMF chain created in the 80s that they should have on in that movie right now. Them BMF chains didn't get created till like 2003. The fuck? Nigga, I ain't never seen no BMF chain till like 2003. Nigga, we was wearing big ass ones like this. Nigga, that's when they came out. So my shit would be the facts and the facts is strong enough. Like with me talking with all this shit is the movie. You can shoot what Meech did since he got to a prison. In these years, since 05 to now, is a whole movie in itself. But instead of dealing with the real entertainer of the situation and the person that was there instrumental in doing all of the shit that pertains to what these people are shooting and what they're recording, they'll leave me out. They won't even talk to me at all. Why? It's got to be a reason. It's got to be a reason. Meech won't tell you that I snitched or I told. That nigga been talking to me for years just fine. He can't tell you that. Y'all ain't seen that shit. There ain't no report where Meech telling everybody, blue is a rat. No. If it was, that shit would be plastered all over the internet, nigga. You wouldn't be able to get away from that. That would be bigger than Gunna and YSL. Got of here. Yes, you know it. If Meech today was already saying, blue is a rat, blue is a rat, that nigga blue DaVinci a rat, nobody... With him, the whole country would have that from Meech, from a typed thing from his computer, like he typed the messages to 50 Cent and be talking to his son and shit. He would have been said that. He can't, because I ain't. At the end of the day, we just got to keep it 100, bro. We got to get the credit to where the credit is due. The gangsters that did the shooting and the gangbanging, it was Cali, bro. Sorry, whoever don't like it, but you know, go look at the tapes. I got all of them around me. Them is all the that's right there. From Compton in the background. From Carson in the background. From LA. From New York. New York Hill in the background. Real gangsters. Ain't none of these getting talked about in the BMF that these people doing. Not that made the impact. It was more than Big Meech that made the impact and Southwest T wasn't with us. So, hello. Now, like I said, their life story from what they was doing as youngsters, can't nobody take that from them. That's great TV for them. It should be called the Flinnery Brothers and not BMF. Because BMF started in Gardena, California, not in Detroit, nowhere. If it's BMF, they wasn't BMFing out there. My they was 50 boys in with PA, Puritan Ave, and Seven Mile Dolls, Annabelle, and all, there was all kind of shit going on that I ain't hearing pop up in the show that they supposed to be giving credit to. Shout out to Detroit. You know, I got love for my D-boys, gated up in the city where they love to shine. Detroit is on their grind. You already know. But it's a lot of places in Detroit and a lot of shit that was going on in me in Meech life that they not giving light to in the TV show. I feel that's a personal thing. But it's a bunch of stuff that they touching on that didn't even happen. And it was a lie. And they fabricating the truth and bringing to believe something that wasn't. So if we was to go shoot a real movie about BMF and how it started, then everybody would be looking at us like, uh uh, because Star said this. Like, no, it wasn't no BMF chain. Them niggas wasn't saying BMF back then, nigga. That shit didn't get popping until it wasn't no more stomping ground entertainment. Me just them label. Once it wasn't no more stomping ground entertainment, then we made BMF Entertainment as a record label and put marketing tools to it so it could be marketed and turned into a brand to be branded as a, a urban household name. So I keep telling everybody, nigga, this shit was a company. It was a business. That's why people know what it is today. Not just because Big Meech was selling drugs. Nigga, that nigga had been selling drugs since he was 15, nigga, 20 years or something. 16, 18 years he had been selling drugs, making a bunch of money, and the whole nation didn't know. They didn't know what it was called. They didn't know who he was. It wasn't until after he met Blue. And then they did a record label called BMF Entertainment and did the promotion and had billboards in Atlanta and had 40 wearing the same T-shirt. Then the nation started, oh, BMF, oh, what they doing? They got a bunch of cord in the strip club. Oh, Big Meech, he the leader. That's when everybody found out. It was my marketing attempt that put the shit on. Along with his money. He been had the money, but he had never been had a Blue Da Vinci next to him. He had Southwest T his whole life. Southwest T ain't turned that shit into a household name. Blue Da Vinci did. Southwest T just run along with his brother. Hello. He could be the big bad boss all he want to be. But I know what's going on. I know where niggas business savvy was. And it wasn't there. We ain't have no businesses and no stores and no shit to last and that could be legal for when niggas got in trouble with some shit over there that families could have like a mob supposed to have we ain't had that and nigga Meech didn't want to hear none of your fucking ideas nigga he didn't want to hear shit 
We fi- he finally first buy a club because he liked to be in the club so much and the feds was watching that motherfucker and that made him say, fuss, why well, I don't do no business with this legal shit. I don't do no, only close to legal shit that shit Blue doing for the record label and my name ain't on that. That's how I used to be, bro. Know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, bro, it is what it is. It was what it was. And I'm still here, my and, and I'm into something totally different these days, bro, which is crazy. Like after all that gangster shit I just talked, right? What the f- everybody up is to know that I'm into gaming at this point in time in my life at 44 years old. I got a gaming company because that's where the money at. The money been in the internet, but right now they get in left music. It didn't leave music because people still getting money there. But it spread it to gaming. And now ga- nigga, motherfuckers is treating gaming like they treated independent music when the music went crazy independent and the labels broke down into the three major labels and all of what we knew as major labels turned into ind- major independence. Same thing is happening with the gaming industry. And I just jumped in there when I seen T Grizzly and these putting us on to it, you know? I'm tired of being one of the last to do some shit. want to be one of the, being there with the pioneers, some of the first getting millions out of some shit and then watch the rest of the whole world come and do it. You know, I've always been like a trendsetter and like that. So good listener. I seen T Grizzly put some shit up. I was already watching them shits. Now I got two cities. I got BMF World Gangland, BMF World RP. I got a paid city that you come in and a free city. You know what I'm saying? And they just like GTA and you come in and just live your life like you living it right now in real life, but you come living in my city. You know what I'm saying? So shit is lit. But that's what I'm on. I'm trying to get street and other older, younger females, everybody to tap into this shit and start getting a Twitch following up. I'm trying to encourage people to leave that Instagram alone and start promoting themselves on Twitch because that's where the money is. That's where you get paid to be. You know what I'm saying? And then a big way to do it is video games, but you can do anything. Just put the camera on yourself and talk, build a following, ask the people from Instagram that follow you, that like you to come over to Twitch and watch you. And they'll eventually subscribe to you after a while and just create that content and put it up. So that's what I'm advocating now, even over music and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? It's easy. It's something everybody not talented enough to rap. Anybody can learn how to pick up the joystick and play a game. You know what I'm saying? So that's what niggas on. First of all, that video was taken months before the show dropped, first and foremost. That was me on my Instagram live answering a question. I was just on live, wasn't talking about no BMF show, wasn't going on no rent. I'm up, asked me, what, hey, is you involved with the BMF show or what you think about the BMF show? And I was just telling, I was just telling them, like, you know, we in, we not involved with it. Whatever it is, only one way to tell the story. Like some of the same shit I'm saying right now is what I was saying. And I was just saying like, uh, uh, you know, they was asking me, am I in it? And I'm like, nah, I ain't in it. And they were saying like, well, if, what if they, is they going to put your character in it? And I'm like, I mean, if they doing a BMF story, they're going to have to put my character in it at some point. Now, once they put my character in them up, it's going to depend on how I'm reacting. I was just saying like, if they put my name in, with my character and make the character on screen do some shit or act like or do some shit that ain't me that I didn't do and they making me look a certain way that's a negative way or whatever then nigga I'm gonna come I don't know how I'm gonna come I don't know what I would do I don't know if I would argue I don't know if I would fight I don't know if I would throw a rock I don't know if I would bust a shot I don't know if I would call a lawyer I don't know what I would do but it ain't gonna be nothing and that's what the point that I was trying to make nigga and I was just going into my shit like I'll be them bust shots all at the it ain't no telling what I would do because I don't even know I would have to be in that situation. Like, imagine this, bro. Imagine I'm watching the BMF TV show and then the character come on named Lou and is the artist and he met in Gardena and is the artist and it's me. So I know it's Blue is supposed to be Lou. They can't use my name, so they use Lou. And so that sounds like Blue and he's playing the character. So now I know that's me. Right. And then he kiss a man and he's a gay rapper. So now they turn because they're able to write whatever they want in there and they're not using my name so they can take the character and do whatever they want with it. So if they take the character and make it do something that ain't me, that I ain't did and they lie, try to make they make me tell if they make me do anything that's not in my character that I didn't do, then I'm going to have an issue with it. Let me just put it like that. And that's all I was telling to the people that I was talking to in my life. It wasn't something that I went on that was going at them because of the show came out. They just cut it up and they waited and sat on it. And waited till the shit released and they released it after the show came out and they made it look like that's what I did. It's called marketing, bro. 
This is how they got some more steam and some more people talking about the show before, like, why I was airing. Maybe the numbers wasn't as good as projected, so it's time to crank this shit up a bit. Let's go out there and talk shit about Blue Da Vinci. Everybody know about Blue Da Vinci as it pertains to BMF. So if we talk shit about him at 50 Cent time in and say something, there's going to be a million people that comment that say something about it. All that shit is marketing, bro. 50 ain't never called me like a real man, nigga, and said nothing. Hey, bro. Saying this over here about you now, you done been to my crib. I know we got some people in common. My barber light used to cut your hair when you lived out here and shit. Like, what's up, bro? Like, what really went on? Like, nigga, that's a real, that's what a real nigga do, a real man. That's what I would do if I knew it and I know I could get on the phone with it or something. And it's something like somebody telling me some shit. First of all, I'm going to check this person. Be like, bro, come with the paperwork. They ain't came with the paperwork. I would have never said nothing. Number one. Number two, once they didn't come with the paperwork, that's really going to make me say, hey, Check this out. Bro, sudden such them over here acting like it's like this and it's like that. Let me know what it is, bro, because I ain't finna be in the middle of no bullshit. Did you tell? Is you hot? What's going on? Because I'll fuck around and go hard on your ass, man. But before I go hard, I got to keep it gangster. What's up? See, that's what it's supposed to do. It ain't nothing wrong with having a conversation before you fall out or having a conversation before you make a million dollars with a nigga. Nothing wrong with having that conversation, bro. Get some straightening and some understanding on what two individuals as grown men is and how they going to move forward. You understand what I'm saying? So when it jump out there and say some shit like 50 Cent jump out there, he put a meme of me up with my face on there. And then he writes my name, Blue Da Vinci. And under it, he put informer. Uh Uh-oh. See, now you screaming around the wolf. Like, don't wake him up, bro. He was asleep. He ain't even tripping. He just kicking it. Y'all do y'all shit. He got his way. He feel he's entitled to that. But y'all niggas want to play with it, right? All right, 50, did you know that the lady that you got the movie deal with is a federal informant, been since 2009? Yeah, Tammy Cowens, your business partner, the one that you got to keep talking to in order for y'all to put shit on the screen as it pertains to Big Meech. She's an informant. Oh, you ain't, oh, hello? I ain't hear none. Crickets, nigga. Ain't nobody going to say nothing back? Oh, three days later, my motherfucking Instagram was hacked. <laughs> I ain't lying. You feel me? So be playing a different game out here, dog. This shit ain't about what you think it's about. These niggas out here playing for, for views and, and, and streams and shit. You know what I'm saying? So unless we're going to get out here and start playing for views and streams with these and then be available for all the wreck and ain't ducking no wreck, you ain't going to have no Blue Da Vinci's running around, nigga, until it like me pop out and do this. Now, you mentioned it a little while back. Did something happen between you and uh, Little Meech? Oh, uh, yeah. One day, Little Meech, after the last time I talked to Meech, once they understood that I had this paperwork for some reason, Little me and Little Meech was just fine. Like, my nephew's coming to my house here in Miami, smoking when his mama still wouldn't let him smoke it in her house. And I'm up. You know what I'm saying? Everything was fine and cool with me and Little Meech. And I called him over to the house one day, gave him the information. He was going to be going on a visit to his dad in a couple of weeks. And I gave him the information and told him to memorize it and tell his dad what was going on so I know he knew. And from that point, my in Detroit started saying that Lil Meech and his sister was running around saying that their daddy was saying that I wasn't no good. And, you know, he didn't, see, he didn't say that I was a rat, but he was just saying that I wasn't no good. So I didn't mean if I ain't hold him down or whatever it was, I guess trying to turn people against me. So that was the first that was with Lil Meech. And then next thing you know, when the TV show dropped, me and him had a big argument in one of the stores. He came in and was talking shit. And I often try to get my son and him to go get a head up fade and shit. Him and my son, because my son was in there working at the time. He was talking all that shit. Ain't like, I'm just going to rip him apart. This one of our kids. You know what I'm saying? I held him as a baby in my arms. So I don't look at him as a peer that I need to be going to fisticuffs with or nothing like that. He's more like a kid I put over my lap and give him a spanking. It's kind of how I look at him. So I would rather tell my son, hey, bro, take this fade, man. You know, the kids could get down in my name and our names and his daddy in my name get down and shit like that. And then, you know, Meech had contacted my uh, cousin Bull and telling him he wanted to get Wise Blue out there arguing with Lil Meech. And you know, he told him, man, Lil Meech can't disrespectful for what? He said, well, why is he, what for what? Why is he? And ooh, we, this little bitch ass name got brought up. And Meech's like, what the f he doing talking to this? All this shit that went on. But then he, he was telling my cousin he wanted to get on the phone with me and talk to me. And that was just the last I heard from him. Like, I never talked to him from that situation or nothing. That was 2017. I'm saying so now. Shit, it's five years later, Brody. We in 2000, motherfucking 23. You feel me? It's five Man. years later, and 
it is what it is. Now you got the TV show out with the whole nation. Like, oh, yeah, this the shit. This ain't how it went. And guess what? Look at this information. Now everybody reevaluate what they doing. What's happening? Overall, how do you feel about the TV show? Um, well, I, I ain't watched that much of it, but, you know, I'm an actor and shit. So I've been, like I was saying, I've been doing film and shit like that since I was 19 years old, bro. I'm 44. I didn't co-star, uh, I mean, not co-star, but supporting cast in a Tupac film and shit. I didn't got killed by leprechauns in movies. Like, I done did quite a few things, you know what I'm saying? So I like TV. So I'm going to like it anyway, just because I like TV. But I know it. So I just know, like, you know what I'm saying? I lived it. So it's like. I didn't live that part, but I know the part that I did live, what they telling is merging it together and it wasn't there then. So to me, it's just not real. It's not believable to me. Most of the shit that happened, I already knew that it happened. Like the real shit that happened with him, I already knew from over the years living with him. He didn't told me all of the stories and shit before. So most of the shit that you will see, I already know. But all of the added shit, the fabricated shit is what make me like, don't watch it like that. Like how I watch Snowfall. See, because I, I don't know Freeway Ricky them story like that. I just know of it a little bit. I wasn't in it to know it, to watch Snowfall and be like, man, this shit's some bullshit. Like, this shit didn't go like that. This shit wasn't like that. This nigga didn't even talk like that. Like, bro, who is writing this shit? Like, I can't say that about Snowfall. It's just good TV for me. It's one of the best movies on TV. You know what I'm saying? Type shit. So, I, I don't have nothing to say bad about the move, the star's production on the film or the writers or whatever they writing. They only can write the information they're getting. You know what I'm saying? If they ain't got the right people around for the writers to feed off of and write the story, then it's going to turn out like that. So it's to be expected. But I think it's shot pretty good. I think the actors are doing pretty good. I think Lil Meech is doing good. You know what I'm saying? Um, he surprised me a lot because he's a real quiet kid. He's like real soft spoken and quiet. Don't really talk here. Be in a room full of people won't say shit. And just to see him just come out of that shell and do the interviews and be more vocal and shit. You know, I was proud of him for that shit. You know what I'm saying? So much as people think I got beef with him and don't like him and shit like that. It ain't even nothing like that, bro. Even now he didn't been disrespectful and all that. It's, I look at it like one of the kids getting mad at the parents and talking shit. Man, fuck my daddy. I don't want to fucking clean up these more. Dishes, nigga, bitch ass nigga, that's why. What, 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 what? That's how I looked at Lil Meech going on his rent. Even though I got mad and wanted my son to take the fade, I still didn't like, yeah, we gonna fuck this nigga up, nigga, next week, or when we catch him at a show. It ain't nothing like that. It's still family. Like, even Meech's family and the people that I got close to and shit like that, I don't look at them a certain kind of way because he did some third party cooperation, you know what I'm saying? Even, even if they don't like me because of the information. Like, the truth can't be considered disrespect, bro. It is what it is, my nigga. Now, you can hate me, or you can say, hey, he kept it 100, or you can never talk to me. You could try me, see how that turned out, whatever. I'm just here for it. You feel me? You know, man, your story was dope, man. Um, great history, man. You know, BMF has became a real big, a real big thing, man. Iconic thing, iconic time in, uh, you know, hip hop. And, you know, it, it was just, uh, you know, it was a dope story, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, and it, it was a bunch of cons we went over, but it was so many pros to the situation, man. Like the unity, you feel me? Like was one of the biggest things, man, to see so many people from different states and different, you know what I'm saying? Like with different uh, 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 lingo and different ways of dressing and everything to just men together and everybody get along and can get money together and go out and party together. Like I, I really want to create that same feel with people that got money that's on a legal standpoint where everybody legal, but you still got 40, 50, with the bag that all come together to go have events and go places and do I'm still trying to create that. And I know we could continue business like that and we could link up good people like that. Well, that's what it is, man. You know, yeah. it sounds like it's going to be hard to create, man. It, it, it sounds no, like it, it was, it's uh, not, it's, it's definitely not hard to create because all it is is people with money, bro. It's the same thing with BMF is get money can come together and everything's fine. So it's not hard to put people together. It's just like-minded people. You can't have a bunch of people from different walks that got different ideologies on life and try to put them together. You got to kind of put the people that are like people together that's having, you feel me, that want to provide for others, that want to see others have, and you feel me, that like to go out and do things and shit like that. You know, people with big hearts and shit like that. When you start getting 30 and 40 of them together at one time, bro, you got black men, black men moving forward, bro. I'm trying to tell you, brothers moving forward 100%. You will have it. I see it. It's a crew out here, bro, called 
uh, 1,000 families. I don't know if you hip to them, but this is a crew of millionaires like what I'm talking about. They just not called BMF, Brothers Moving Forward. They're called 1,000 families and they black and, and Latino and, and, and they rich, bro. And it's a bunch of them that be coming together and they go on trips out of the country and they have seminars and they share business and they do all kind of shit. You people tap into this lady called Coach Stormy and shit. They, they all tapped in with this thousand family shit, bro. But I'm trying to do something like that inside this urban real realm of it. You know what I'm saying? Not just the regular square people that already got their shit together. I'm trying to do it with the that can figure out how to retire from the streets and start their businesses and got their trucking companies and got their stores and got their stocks and got they whatever they got to get they self where they at and they know how to help people get there and help people do business and you know what I'm saying be legit and shit like that when you start pinning them people together bro they running around they out here we just don't know them cause we still be all on this bullshit so we left around the like people we all with the people that's on the same bullshit and when you go who you think Jay Z hanging out with and going to eat lunch and shit with all the time not everybody from Marcy not no disrespect to everybody from Marcy, but they still over in Marcy trying to figure it out. He didn't figure it out and left and he didn't place himself where he need to be to get where he trying to go. That's what I'm trying to do with the same street. You know, just because you a street don't mean that you done for. Look at Pete from uh, QC. If I don't know. He's a street out there doing everything that a street nigga do. And he made it out. If he could do it and put all them different people on, then... I could do it and put all them different people on. You could do it and put all, y'all could do it and put all them people on. And then once everybody got that like mind on business and togetherness and equality and ain't no big me and little you and shit like that, then we could progress and move forward as a people, an urban community, not just black, not just Latino, not just whatever is the minority from wherever you at is your urban community. You know what I'm saying? Type shit. Man, I hear you, man. That sounds like, that sounds pretty dope, man. Yeah, that's what it is. And if you don't like that, then we on your ass, boy. No homo. Well, that's what it is, man. Hopefully it works out, man. You doing any more music or anything? Um, So all the music that I'll be doing is coming through the video gaming. And it'll be getting released through the gaming initially. And then it'll go on. To, so, yeah, I'll still be releasing music, but just not in the traditional form. It'll all be coming through the cities first. They'll come out of the cities as promotion. And then they'll go to the Internet in real life. Okay, is there anything else you're working on you want to talk about? No, nah, that's it. Just this gaming, bro. I'm just encouraging people to tap into 5M, tap into the gaming community, tap into T Grizzly and Grizzly World and what they doing because that's a quick way to watch it and fall in love with it and just kind of see what's going on with Twitch, man, because, you know, that's my way to put people on some bread. Come and talk and tell their story and say shit, but you can never leave with getting your hands on no money out these interviews with my shit one thing for certain you motherfuckers got instagram go get twitch and start bringing your people from instagram to twitch and start getting live on your twitch like how you do on instagram live you're guaranteed to start making money and probably thank me one day that's it that's what it is man well once again man i appreciate you taking the time man ease all right bro What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.